Okay. Okay, we, we are transmitting for YouTube uh, right now. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the School of Communication Arts of University of Sao Paulo greets the participants of the se uh, Semiotics of Unpredictability, the international seminar to celebrate Yuri Lotman's centenary. It is a great pleasure that I hear in this I, I, to be here in this opening session. I am Irene Machado, and I would like to introduce Professor Douglas Galan, my colleague in this journey. Professor Claudia Lago is a little bit uh, late, but I think she is coming. Uh, the head of the Department of Communication and Arts of University of Sao Paulo, and my colleague, Professor Roseli Figaro, uh, here at USP and the national president of Association of Post-Graduation Program in Communication Studies. I'd like to introduce this section, inviting um, Professor Roseli Figaro to greet all of us. Thank you. Please, Roseli. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to participate in the opening of this important international seminar. My congratulations to the initiative and the effort of Professor Irene Machad, president of the seminar. I want to congratulate the professor for the wonderful work of translating Lotman's book. These activities show the vigor and the resistance of our research, even in such a difficult moment in our country, whose future will be decided next Sunday. I wish you all an excellent event. Thank you for invitation, congratulations, excellent event for you. Thank you. Thank you, Roseli, and thank you for being with us. Uh, I think in this terrible moment, but it's very nice to be with you. Thank you very much. I, I know you have uh, so many activities and I am very happy for you being here. Thank you very much. And now I would like to, to call my partner in this journey, uh, Douglas Galan, to his introducing to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Irene, uh, and everyone. Good morning. It's a good, uh, great pleasure to stay here today in the celebration. Despite all the adversities, we had a great insistence on making the seminar happen, uh, precisely because uh, this year is a unique moment for us to pay a tribute to this great theorist, semiotician, to whom we want owe much of our research and who feed a good part of our thoughts. I thank Irene especially for the invitation and perseverance, and also thank our colleagues in our research crew who help us in this process and who uh, are now divided into uh, roles and coordinating the tables and panels for the presentations of papers during uh, the next three days. Uh, we are also uh, immensely grateful to all the guests, speakers, professors, and the students from uh, all communication sections who accepted our invitation and understood, and understood our proposal. Uh, we decided we decided precisely to carry out this tribute, not only celebrating the centenary of Yuri Lotman, but also involving and deepening one of the concepts created by Lotman uh, through his journey, through his journey, uh, especially published in his posthumously work. The, unpred in the unpred unpredictable workings of culture. Uh, this gave us a boost to, the, uh, deba to debate on the concept of unpredictability in this seminar. 
in order to show how much Lotman work is, is still alive, present, important, and is still present uh, among with us. Uh, and um, we are very happy to receive uh, a great number and significant works uh, to have committed to accomplishing this task, this purpose. So it's a huge pleasure to be here. And we uh, have a, a, a great pleasure to receive all of us, all of you. And uh, we hope that uh, all you have a great seminar for the next three days. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas, uh, unfortunately, uh, Claudia is not here until now. So I'd like to introduce uh, a little bit words, few words for you. But I think I can, uh, I would like to, go to share my, uh, to share my, uh, I don't know, I lose, I lost you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, where are you? We are seeing your uh, screen, Lynn. Yeah? Yes. But I can't find my, my, my stream. I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Where am I? I don't know what happened here. Ah. Can you see my 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 screen? Yes. But I don't know what happened, but because my 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 screen is not here. Where it is? What are are you uh, choosing? Maki. Mas o que que você está procurando exatamente? Eu estou procurando a minha tela. Eu não estou vendo. A gente está vendo uma tela de Word. Ah, eu vou tentar sair e entrar de novo. Sabe? Professora, talvez no, no botão do Zoom, na parte inferior direita, aí, do ligue. lado... Nada. Ó, oh, tá vendo? No, bot no botão azul do Zoom, no ícone azul? É isso, tô aqui nele. E o pior de tudo é que eu não consigo nem sair. Mas eu sei eu que vou... eu estou aqui. Eu vou parar a sua apresentação. Ver ah, se entrei, voltou. entrei, entrei, entrei. Vocês estão me vendo? Sim. Quando você for compartilhar, na, na setinha da direita, ele pergunta as opções de, do que você vai compartilhar. E aí você Nossa. seleciona a janela exata. Então, eu, eu selecionei aqui a janela exata. É essa aqui, tá vendo? Isso, e aí vai sumir mesmo, a gente some, fica só a janelinha pequenininha. Oh, eu sumi tudo. Ok, thank you, I'm so sorry for this, but I will try, are you listen, uh, listen and, and see my screen? Yes, yes. Ok. Sim. Um, and now, I would like to greet all the participants of the session. Uh, we're, just, uh, we're not just here to celebrate Lotman's life. We are here to honor uh, uh, we are here to honor uh, Lotman's ideas about culture that do not exist. Uh, 
to deal with complex problems of sign production as fundamental semiotics problems, inter and transcultural uh, relation in their different crosses. With this, with some. Uh, uh, With this, the most different problems become themes of his semiotic approaches. Uh, the theme of unpredictability as an agent of, his, of historical cultural changes is one of them. That is why we are here in this seminar. This, the theme of unpredictability runs through Lotman's work and organizes the ideas of his last published, the book, Unpredictable Mechanisms of Culture, whose translation in Portuguese will be released this Friday, the anniversary of his death. Unpredictability translates with distinction the semiotic spirit of our time, of uncertainties, instabilities, of disarrangements in different spheres of social life. Like Lotman studied in his book, in his book, the more instabilities increase, the more the cultural codes get mixed and the specific spheres of meaning are lost. It's not easy to deal with cultural dynamics and their instabilities when the notion of history that guides uh, guide us predicts only a gradual and casual develop development. In these semiotic studies of history, Lotman never neglected the disruptive themes in favor of the conveniences or a false normality of the history flow. The works to be presented at the seminar explore disruptive process uh, according to different approaches. The School of Communication Arts opening its virtual space so that this act of celebration could become a semiotic space, space for circulation of these different approaches, idea, ideas, and languages. Inside the semiosphere borders uh, do not separate but become an open space for dialog dialogical diversities, like the ones that are happening right now when I talk for you to Spanish and English and Russian speakers. May we all enjoy this space of freedom. Obrigada, bienvenidos, gracias, welcome, thanks. Uh, in this moment, I would like to say uh, that this uh, event is possible Great thanks to School of Communication and Arts and our uh, institution of financial support, FAPESP, Foundation of Research in Brazil, and the Department of Research of University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I have a pleasure to work with the group, uh, the, the, the semiotic space of cultural, audiovisual culture in Sao Paulo, and with these, these uh, researchers, Professora Andrea Moura, Professora Daniela Oswald Ramos, Professor uh, Daniel Felipe Fonseca, Lívia Cristina Machado, e os, os estudantes, the students, Arthur Simon Zanella, Gisele Frederico, and the students of a graduation course, Luisa Vasconcelos and Olivia Barin. Barin. I'd like to great uh, to thanks to the board, the science, scientific board, uh, besides the, the, the research group of uh, PUC of, of Sao Paulo, uh, André Guimarães, USP, 
University of São Paulo, Ariel Gomes Ponce, Argentina, Beth Bright, USP, Daniel Felipe Fonseca, USP, Daniela Oswald Ramos, USP, Douglas Vinícius Galã, USP, Helena Vassna, USP, Fátima Aparecida dos Santos, University of Brasília, Lívia Cristina, USP, Olga Pampara, University of Rosário, Argentina, Regiana Miranda Nakagawa, University of Bahia, Silvia Barei, University of Córdoba, Argentina. Eu gostaria de... I would like to thanks to Luisa Vasconcelos Rodrigues, designer, uh, João uh, Carlos Megali, the technician of audiovisual, and Fabio Cato, the, 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 the programmer of the, uh, the, our uh, uh, abstracts. Um, in this moment, uh, I would like to, to remember three of our colleagues that are not with us anymore. Uh, besides Desiderio uh, Navarro, I would like to, uh, to ask for you one minute silence, silence for Alexandre Rocha da Silva and Jorge Lozano. Thank you. Both were invited to be with us, but unfortunately, they are not. Let's and, now, and now I'd like to invite Douglas Galan to close this section before we uh, start uh, our uh, works today. I would like to thank you and I apologize for the problems here but I think we can have a good journey. Uh, thank you very much again. And please, Douglas. Thank you, Irene. So um, after this formal moment, uh, we are opening the first session of our seminar. Uh, Irene and I will be the hosts of our first session call it Impacts and Complexities of Cultural Historical Process. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Douglas, a moment, please. I'd like to, to, to ask to Professor Roseli. I don't know, I, I think she, you have so many uh, activities today. So uh, if you, you wanted to be with us, it's a pleasure, but I think if you have, to, 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 to leave, uh, don't you worry about us. Okay. Thank you, very great uh, seminar for us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. I am a little uh, nervous about this and about the problem with Claudia. I am so sorry, I apologize, but I, I really don't know what happened, but we can start now. Thank you very much. Uh, the okay. first, okay, Douglas. Okay, okay, let's go. The first session is called Impacts and Complexities of Cultural Historical Process. Uh, in this panel, we will have the lectures for, from Mihail Lotman from Estonia, José Amário Pinheiro from Brazil, Julieta Idar from Argentina, and Alexei Semenko from Sweden. Um, just, uh, 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 just our words, uh, according to our program, we are planning a dynamic of 40 minutes maximum for all our guests of all sections during our seminar, 
uh, to do their lectures. After this, at the end of the sections, we will have 30 minutes to have a conversation between our guests and our online audience. So if anybody has any questions during the lecture, uh, the person can write in the chat, uh, in Zoom box chat or in YouTube box chat. And uh, in the end of the section of all lectures, of four, uh, all four lectures, we will ask the question for the speaker. Uh, so um, our first guest is Mihail Lotman, uh, directly connected to Yuri Lotman, the man we are celebrating during, during uh, these three days. And Mihail will be lecturing semiotics of unpredictability and some aspects of Russian culture. Uh, so please welcome Mihail and feel free to start our lecture right now. Uh, thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Irena, for the invitation. Do you see my uh, PowerPoint? Not yet. I will uh, uh, try again. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about yes. now? We are seeing. Yes. Great. I will start. Uh, uh, on February 28, 2022, Yuri Mikhail Shvotman would have turned 100 years old. To commemorate this anniversary, an international semiotic congress was held in the universities of Tartu and Tallinn from 25 to 28th February. The Congress was overshadowed by Russian aggression against Ukraine launched on February 24. The sounds of artillery cannonade echoes in the auditoriums of the Congress. The last monograph of uh, by Yuri Lopman was entitled Culture and Explosion. An explosion breaks the flow of time and uh, nullified regular processes. So I must confess that the text brought to you attention differs significantly from the one what I had was uh, pre prepared uh, originally. I am not a supporter of banal aphorism according to which when the cannons roar, the muses are silent. But against the background of the cannonade, one should not pretend that it is not heard. Therefore, I beg your pardon for the fact that today I view slightly strengthened the fort uh, uh, and uh, at the expense of the piano. Uh, already in the very beginning of the war, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, speaking in the Bundestag, said, the word will no longer be the same. In fact, the point is whether force will prevail over right, whether Putin will be able to turn back the clock in the era of great power politics of the 19th century, or else we will find the strength to put war mongers like Putin to their place. And this was stated by the head of the country, which until the last moment tried to quote, understand Putin. While agreed to the main point of Chancellor Scholz, I still consider it necessary to note that the range of possibilities created by this explosion cannot be reduced to two. I don't want to understand Putin. So um, the explosion of a relatively peaceful state was at the same time explosion of the narrative possibilities. It also destroys the plans of the aggressor who initiated the war. Mr. Putin started the war that uh, was uh, unexpected, not only for those whom he considered his enemies, but also for his own uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Putin believed that in this way, he had summed up his glorious rule. It turned out that the, flowing, uh, that the blowing 
up not only the dominant narrative, but also the foundation of international law. He plunged his own country in the space of troubles. Russian term smuta does not have an exact equivalent in other languages. So uh, usually uh, in English is uh, used as troubles. Periods of troubles periodically occur in the history of Russian culture. In the article, The Mechanism of Troubles, Mechanism Smuta, Lotman in 1982, wrote that the periods of troubles, when established connection and meanings are cancelled, on the one hand, arise unexpectedly as a result of an explosion, on the other hand, are the natural result of the dynamics of binary systems. I will make a few remarks about the binarism in Russian culture below. In his uh, latest book, uh, Culture and Explosion, Yuri Lotman was a passage from Chesterton novels, novel, uh, The Man Who Was Thursday. Uh, in the compartment of the train are detective and an anarchist, both poets. The essence of both is revealed in their artistic taste. Sorry, it's quotation from Lotman now. Uh, in uh, artistic taste. The anarchist cursed the prose of railroad traffic in which the segments of station are predeterminated. The, he sees poetry in surprise, and surprise brings an explosion. To this, the detective returns. I tell you that every time a train comes, I feel that it was broken past batteries of besiegers and that man has won the battle against chaos. You say contemporary, contemporary uh, that when uh, one has left uh, Sloan Square, they must come to Victoria. I say that one might be thousand things instead, and that whenever I really come here, I have a sense of narrow escape. And then I heard, and when I heard the guard uh, start the word Victoria, it's not a meaningless word. It is to me the cry of herald announcing conquest. It is indeed Victoria. It is a victory. The piquancy here is that the, we find ourselves in the world where well-being is less likely than murder. Therefore, the absence and even carries more information, uh, absence uh, of an event carries more information than its present. And what? Uh, so far, an anarchist, uh, so, sorry, so for the anarchist, it is important to violate the law and establish order. While for policemen, it's implementation. Paradoxically, despite of the opposite of tests and beliefs, there is a significant uh, com uh, commonality of their position. But for both speakers, a meaningful event is something that violates their expectation or fears. The anarchist lives in the world of boring routine, which he is going to blow up in the true uh, sense of the world. While for detective, he lives in the world of uncontrollable and dangerous chaos, in which it's necessary to create islands of order. The arrival uh, of the train at the terminal station, according to the shadow, is a significant event, a victory. The event creates meaning. To understand means to grasp their patterns. Uh, next section, the past. According to the generally accepted point of view, in the field of the humanities, knowledge is connected with the past. This is one of the difference between the humanities and natural science. Knowledge of the patterns of social and spiritual developments is based on the experience of the past. You can only know the past, the future can't be guessed or predicted. 
knowing the future is the domain of prophets, not scientists. This is the generally accepted point of view. But the semiotics of culture introduce certain correction here. The first of these uh, concerns is, uh, the first of these concerns the accuracy of knowledge of the past. Yuri Lotman liked to quote and accept from the draft of Boris Pasternak uh, poem, uh, The High Illness. Once Hegel, in a Ventrally and probably a random quote the historian a prophet predicting backwards. This fragment has attracted a lot of attention, mainly because Hegel here metonymically replaced Friedrich von Schlegel. But another thing is important. According to Pasternak and Schlegel, historical knowledge is based not on rational empirical foundation, but on revelation. According to Lotman, the non variance of the past is a fiction resulting of the projection of a narrative scheme into the past. The past is multivariate as a future. Moreover, unrealized opportunities in the past can have a perturbing effect on the present and future, just as phantom pains can occur in amputated legs or hands. Lotman uh, quote, a uh, quote, sorry, Lotman quote, a short note by the famous linguist Alexander Isachenko, innovative and quoted it is entirely in his uh, article on the mechanism of smuta. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of the uh, article. It is clear that history is not written in the conditional. However, the assertion that actually happened, should happen, should happen in this way, must be recognized as unconvincing. It is easy to become a prophet in uh, inside. Uh, history always has several uh, options at the ready, and there is no reason to consider what actually happened, no matter how it becomes of a manifestation of progressive course of history. The whole development of Russia would have turned out completely differently if uh, at the end of the 15th century, Novgorod, but not Moscow, had turned out to be the leader, dominant force on the, uh, of the United uh, country. And such possibility really exists. Unrealized possibilities of the past can become not only objects of reflection, but also guidelines for future development. Here is Lotman wrote. The moment of explosion is characterized by the ejection of a whole bunch of potentially possible extensions. The subsequent historical process, as it were, carries out a selection. Certain tendencies, tendencies sorry, are suppressed, other are a further development. Immediately after the explosion, the number of potential future roads are, is large. Then comes the selection process. It is important to emphasize here that this selection in the immediate uh, vicinity of uh, the explosion as a role has a random, unpredictable character. In the future, however, it includes the factor of consciousness human activity, which makes efforts to suppress certain aspects of reality and declare them non-existent and squeeze the rest as much as possible into the ideal model uh, imposed of history. In these processes are taken, if these processes are taken into account, it's become as obvious that the historian must study not only the established and the retrospectively canonized uh, appearance and uh, of events, but also the potential parts that have remained unrealized. The second problem is related to the truth of what happened. It, in, true, in turn, is devised into two. Whether the story about the past is true and whether the past itself is true. <coughs> uh, 
consider this with uh, consider this with one example where the both of these aspects are closely inter uh, Since Boris and Greb both killed in uh, 2015, uh, are among the most revered saints in the Russian Orthodox Church. Princess Boris and Gleb become the first Russian saints. They were canonized as passion bearer, making them the patrons of uh, Russian land and the uh, heavily helpers of heavenly helpers of Russian princes. What they holiness consider consisted in the first glance is not very clear. They were not preachers. They did not perform the, any bits of, of faith and family. They, they did was not an act of martyr for the faith. Uh, according to the tale of bygone wears for Israeli and the leaves of the saints, they were killed by mercenaries sent by the brothers Svetopov. Their holiness was manifested manifested in not resistance to the murderers. Therefore, they were given at the title not of martyrs who suffer from the faith, but passion bearers. Immediately after their death and burial, miracles related to them began to occur. The murdered prince uh, brothers become the first Russian science, and their murderer brother uh, received a nickname first. Under the name Svetopolk the Accursed, Svetopolk Akayane, he has written in history. What is not true in this story? Almost everything. Svetopolk did not kill his brothers. Nothing one knows about uh, to the uh, contemporaries about holiness of Paris and Gleb. Hilarion, Metropolitan of Kiev, in his Sermon of Law and Grace, which he wrote several decades after uh, the assassination, carefully enumerated all the Christian achievement of Kiev. But he knows nothing about Paris and Gleb or about uh, the accused brother. But this story is found in Scandinavian, in the Western European sources. But the killer is not Sveta Polk, but one of the most respected Russian princes, Yaroslav the Vice, Yaroslav Mudry. Uh, Andrei Yorganov, one of the leading experts of uh, uh, the history of medieval Rus, wrote in his book, Categories of Medieval Russian Culture. As it turned out, the rather complex comparison of old uh, uh, Russian sources with the foreign ones, sagas, chronicles, and others, Svetopolk the first did not kill neither Boris nor Gleb, but his murder, at least for uh, that of Boris, was uh, committed by Yaroslav the Vice. Having fixed uh, in this formulation the seemingly historical reality, your, your kind of comes to conclusion with a very strange of the first glass. Such study of historical past is very fruitful, but it's necessary to remember that for Russian medieval people who were brought in, uh, up in the tradition of Christian hagiographic stories, which uh, describe the tragedy of Princess Persian Abiras, the murder, the murder was committed exactly by the Svetopolk, and Princess Boris and Gleb beheaded as it was described in the stories. What was actually is indeed what was not actually is indeed the reality. It's a very strange sentence because in Russian this this uh, actually and na samom deli are synonyms. So what you're gonna find here? Uh, sorry. Uh, next Give section. Me Give me yeah. I don't know if you are sharing your uh, your screen because it, it is uh, stopped. Sorry, it's uh, unexpected, uh, um, uh, I don't know, event in our connection. No. Okay. So uh, you cannot see my uh, PowerPoint. 
because you are not running it. I don't know what why. I look. Sorry? You are not running the screen. The slide. You are not running. I'm running it. Sorry. We are seeing your screen and your PowerPoint, but yes. you are not changing the screen. Sorry, I'm changed the screen. Oh, in, in yes. my computer is uh, everything oh, is perfect. Because so, for us, is stopped. That, that's that's semiotics on in in, <laughs> in contractibility. So computer is everything oh, is perfect. Because it, that, it's again, stopped. that's semiotics on in in, <laughs> in no. We, we are seeing just a, a block of notes from you, not, yes, now we are seeing your uh, PowerPoint. Thank you. You can see that I changed. Uh, yes, yes, now perfectly. Okay, Thank you. so um, you I'm can in the middle of my this. presentation and now you can see my... <laughs> yes, oh. but yeah, but you can, uh, uh, going to the point you are, you are now, please. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Not now. Not now. It's you can see. Yes. Okay. About now. About. Okay. You can still see. Yes. 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 Thank okay. you. So the next uh, section of my presentation is split truth and split reality. Which past is true? One that is reconstructed by analytical methods from various independent sources or a story fixed in cultural memory and determining the thoughts and actions of people. In Russian culture, the idea of two types of truth has been established. Generally speaking, the words pravda and istina are synonyms, both means the truth. However, in a number of very important contexts, they began not only to differ, but also be opposed to each other. The difference between them is not easy to formulate in even, uh, or even uh, more difficult to translate. In English, both words translated as truth. Also, for example, in German, both terms are translated as die Wahrheit. In Portuguese, every other. In order to distinguish between these concepts, I will call Pravda the truth and Istina the uh, call the verity. The opposition of truth and verity is very strange. And at the same time, it's a stable phenomenon of uh, Russian culture. Let us start with a uh, short text of the famous writer of the second half of 19th century, Ivan Turgenev. He's, he, he's uh, the first of them called Verity and Truth, Istina i Pravda. There is the beginning. Several young people have gathered talking among themselves. And suddenly one of the comrades runs in. His eyes shine with the unusual brilliance. He is shocking with a delight and he had to speak. What, what, my friends, listen uh, to what I have learned. That the verity, what a verity, Istina. The angle of incidents, I, I, incidence is echoed to the angle of reflection. Or oh, there is another. Between two points, the shorter path is the straight line. Really? Oh, what a blessing, how the young people uh, wrote, uh, tenderly drawing themselves into the uh, other arms. Can you imagine, uh, imagine such a scene? You are laughing. That's the point. Verity cannot bring blessing. But truth can. This is a human, our uh, early affair. Truth and 
uh, truth and uh, justice. For truth, I agree to die. In even more paradoxical form, the same uh, uh, theme sounds in the Turgenev's uh, another short story, uh, prayer. Whatever a person pray for, he prays for a miracle. Every prayer boils down to the following. Great God, make sure that twice two is not four. Only such prayer is real prayer, face to face, praying to the universal spirit, the highest being, the Kantian, Hegelian, purified, purified, a imageless God is impossible and unthinkable. But uh, can even a person of living God make sure that twice two is not four? Every believer is obliged to answer it. He can. And is obliged to convince himself of this. Thus, uh, the truth is higher and more valuable. Sorry, that uh, the truth is uh, the truth is higher and more valuable than the verity. The truth is uh, the uh, verity is uh, 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 earthly. The truth is divine. The similar motive uh, is also found uh, by Fyodor uh, Dostoevsky, who was uh, an ideological opponent of Turgenev. If some would prove me that the Christ, that Christ is outside the verity, Istina, and indeed, uh, it's the uh, uh, is Italic, and indeed it would be that the verity is outside of Christ, then I would rather stay with Christ than with the verity. Although Dostoevsky names here only the verity, the truth is uh, also implicitly implied. Christ, for him, is embodiment of truth, not for verity. One should not think that truth, unlike verity, shall be connected with divine principle. Among the Narodniks and materialists, truth was associated with a social justice, while verity was associated with abstract, with abstract concepts. The consequence of this general distinction is the opposition between law and justice. Uh, uh, typical to the democratic and narodnik subculture. The law is abstract and unjust, while justice can be illegal. This motive is already found in Pushkin and runs through the entire Russian culture in the 19th and uh, early 20th centuries. Truth and verity not only do not coincidence, but even come into the conflict. Reflecting on the moral and the intellectual bankruptcy of the Russian intelligentsia in the 19th century, the greatest Russian philosopher of the time, Nikolai Berdeev, also formulated the main problem in the terms of verity and truth. That the title of his essay is The Philosophical Verity and the Truth of Intelligentsia. For, for Berdeev, the value of this concept is the opposite of that of Dostoevsky and Turgenev. The misfortune of Russian intelligentsia and Russian culture, though, according to Berdeev, is that it preferred intuitive and ultimately illusory truth to rational and very verifiable verity. Verity, according to Berdeev, is independent and self-sufficient, while truth is subordinated to various social and utilitarian topics. The rejection of the verity in favor of the truth is among the Russian intelligence, according to Berdeev, a result of laziness and lack of discipline in thinking. There's two aspects of this problem. First, philosophical. Second, semiotical. From philosophical point, uh, it uh, about the relation between truth and reality, or in other words, logic and being. Do the law of logic precede being, or does logic something flow from being? This question has been previously discussed in the theologians, uh, by theologians. Whether God created the universe, guided with the laws of logic that already existed before, or the master of all things is both the master and lord of logic. 
but we will but we will be interested not in philosophical but in semiotical aspect of the problem. Pravda and istina were synonyms in Russia. The splitting of the meaning into two almost autonomous concepts is a special uh, case uh, of the manifestation of very important mechanism of Russian culture. In the most general form, the mechanism can be denoted as binarism. I just, I must immediately emphasize that the point is not the abundance of ordinary equivalent opposition such as good, evil, black, white, and center, but about say about some creative mechanism that create opposition where they are not implied either from the point of view of language or from the point of view of uh, logic or be. Thus, the law is opposed to a grace by metropolitan Hilarion or mercy or, or a law opposed to mercy by Pushkin is uh, the cordiality is opposed to education or well-being, etc. But the less important is the above mechanism of splitting single semantic complex into two into two antagonistic components. Next section. Split time and truth. Uh, 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 in Russia, like in other uh, European countries, the Gregorian calendar is valid, but the church lives according to the Julian calendar. The situation uh, took a schizophrenic turn after Lenin introduced the Gregorian calendar as a, a national uh, calendar in uh, 1918, by the church remained faithful, faithful to the Julian calendar. According to the 19th, starting sorry in the 19th century, even the church circle, there were discussion about need to switch to Gregorian uh, calendar, but it was always being rejected. Various arguments have been made in favor of Julian calendar, including the uh, uh, the one uh, of the uh, Julian uh, calendar is supposedly more accurate than Gre Gregorian. This sustained point was is shared not just of Orthodox theology, theologians, but astronomers connected with the church. The Julian calendar is more correct than Gregorian. Yet here's one more aspect. There uh, is a pattern uh, not in the theology, um, but in social psychology of the Russian Orthodox uh, culture, according to which the church lives. Uh, in the holy and right, and those in the daily life, the same should be the measured differently. Hence, some practical dilemmas arise. Uh, a few years ago, the following discussion about uh, an internet. An Orthodox woman turned to her priest and asked if her family could celebrate the new year with a glass of sparkling wine. Of course not, said the priest, since the new year, Eve, December 31, falls in the nativity of fast or Philippian fast. So you cannot drink champagne yeah, during the fast. Another more liberal priest joined the uh, this, uh, discussion and said, of course it is uh, not recommended, but one glass of wine is allowed. But none of these particulars, neither the woman nor the priest thought of the fact that according to no matter of calendar, Christmas, December 24, 25, uh, cannot be after the new year, Eve, December 31. The participants of uh, the discussion celebrate Christmas in conformity with the Julian calendar and new year, the new year in conformity of the Gregorian. Uh, uh, if the Julian calendar is more correct, it, um, uh, correct and they won't uh, live by it, there won't be no problem. But Christmas uh, would be according to Gregorian calendar on January 6th, year of January 14th. But uh, they 
consciousness is split and therefore they live in split reality in which Christmas is the same time before and after New Year Eve. The opposition of the Gregorian and Julian calendar in the contemporary Russian culture is ambivalent. Reality lies between two of these two. Sometimes, however, the ambivalent opposition of these calendars takes entirely other form. According to some authors, the Orthodox Church cannot change over the Gregorian calendar, since in this case, the Orthodox resurrection can pay the index with the Jewish Pesach, which would be completely unacceptable. Here uh, are not. Uh, uh, it's very important uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, the distinction behind the primitive uh, opposition West versus Russia, so West Gregorian calendar, uh, Russia uh, Union is underlying ambivalent antithesis orthodoxy versus Judaism. <coughs> Uh, the fact that the Julian calendar is preferred uh, has an important consequence. For the most time, one lives in accordance with the wrong calendar, wrong time. Even in the moments where one lives in accordance with the right time, first of all, Christmas and so on, the profound time can be sentenced uh, the celebration of Christmas on January 6th. Yet, and this is, uh, this is important, it is right to live in the wrong time. It's important. Uh, it is right to live in the wrong time, since Western European does not even notice living in the wrong time. Uh, next session, split space. Uh, uh, meeting uh, with uh, uh, young geography enthusiasts in uh, 2014, uh, Mr. Putin declared, Russia's border do not end anywhere, which means that the Russian space has no limits. Compare also the Soviet job, with whom borders the Soviet Union. It borders with whatever, uh, whoever it wishes. Russian space, like Russian time, is characterized by fundamental duality. On the one hand, this space has a physical dimension outlined on, on the map and guarded with the border guards. On the other hand, Russia is a sacred place where the transcendental dimension prevails over the empirical one. Why should Crimea belong to Russia? Putin explained uh, the invasion of Crimea and its uh, connection in uh, 2014 as follows. For Russia, Crimea, ancient Korsun, Hersones, Sevastopol are the great civilization and sacred significance. They are of the great civilizational and sacred significance. Just like Temple Mount in Jerusalem for those who profess Islam and Judaism. After all, after all it was here in Crimea, in ancient uh, Hersones, or in Russian and Russian chronicles called uh, Korsen, the Prince Vladimir was baptized and then baptized the whole Russia. All this uh, is uh, on the other side of the truth and logic. Why? Or what does, uh, does uh, Prince Vladimir Voldemar of Scandinavian blood, blood uh, have to do with the modern Russia? If the, his uh, mythical baptism baptized in Hersonas uh, is the base of uh, possession of Crimea, then according to uh, this logic, Crimea should belong to the, not to the Russia, but to Ukraine. Since uh, Vladimir was the uh, prince of Kiev and Moscow did not exist uh, in this time. In his historical and uh, geographical reasoning, Putin continues the tradition of uh, poetical imperialism. Uh, uh, poetical 
uh, imperialism. Uh, <coughs> the great uh, poet Fyodor Tuchev wrote a poem, Russian Geography. I will not uh, read it, you can uh, see it. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, artistic translation. This is mine. Uh, it's not artistic, but it's more correct. Uh, so, what is the Russian geography? Everything is the Russian because, and the reason is Holy Spirit and Prophet uh, uh, Daniel, the book of Prophet Daniel in the Bible. It is important to know that uh, Fyodor Tuchev was not only a poet, but also a diplomat. Nevertheless, for him, the borders of Russia are not established with the international treaties, but revelation and a very free interpretation of this. The book of Daniel does not mention Russia at all. The special borders, uh, or rather the absence, seem to change uh, over the temporal ones. Russian geography is mystical historiography. Russia is literally unlimited. From this emanate, on the one hand, imperialistic ambition. Turkey, as well as the whole Western Europe, Europe actually belongs to Russia. The reason may be, uh, seem curious. The geopolitical and historical construction called Moscow the third Rome, while Moscow is, first of all, Tsartum, not this, the city. Proceeding from this construction, ours showed the also the second Rome, that is Constantinople, that is Istanbul. But <coughs> actually, Byzantium, that is Turkey, and the first Rome, Rome, and once again, by that means not city, by the entire uh, Roman Empire. Earlier, I quoted uh, Fyodor Tuchev's poem, Russian uh, Joke. I uh, want to uh, end with uh, his probably the most famous uh, poem. <laughs> a short poem. It has no title and consists of only four lines. Um, this is uh, uh, yes, uh, and the left is a artistic translation, and the right is my uh, more exact intervenor translation. So Russian can be it cannot be understood with the intellect. It cannot be measured with the common yardstick. Uh, it yardstick. It has a special trait that in Russia you can only believe. Russia <coughs> is characterized <coughs> by an indefinite space, space time continuum. All space is our, but everywhere we are crumbling. Measuring instruments, yardstick, are powerless in <coughs> its determination. Sorry. Western verity is powerless against Russian truth. Conclusion. We are dealing with the same semiotic mechanism that divide verity and truth and divide time into time of verity, that is profound time, which is measured with the Gregorian calendar and truthful, sacred, and <coughs> is measured by the Julian calendar. Usually these times do not conflict but exist in parallel. Although, as I have already shown, uh, there are also conflict situations, uh, as in the case of Christmas, which comes after the new year, and with space. In parallel to empirical verified uh, Russian uh, space, there's the space of Russian truth, which has no boundaries. Usually, these spaces do not come into conflict. The space of truth is reserved for poetry and political mythology. But when the mythological space passed into the empirical sphere, then the army crosses the border and in the order to establish the mythological truth in the empirical sphere. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Mihail. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Mihail. It's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to hear. 
of course, we have uh, a lot of questions about, and just repeating, if someone has a question, can uh, put in the chat to Professor Mihail answer after. Uh, Professor Mihail, uh, can you stay with us uh, until the end of the, this panel? Uh, yeah, uh, Douglas. Um, first of all, I am now in the Estonian Parliament as a member, and for some time I must go uh, to work. But I will come back, and uh, I hope to be uh, until the end. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, that's okay. Maybe uh, Douglas, Douglas, please. Okay. Maybe mm -hmm. it's uh, is better better to have a. Um, uh, a break after two ex expositions. So I think that the, the, the questions can be done after two expositions. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. so uh, we can continue with the next uh, exposition. Um, and uh, after Professor Mihai, we will, we will have uh, Professor José Amário Pinheiro from Brazil. Uh, José Amário is, uh, is our next guest. And uh, Professor, uh, you are ready to start our lecture? Amário? It's better to, to close this uh, presentation. Uh, yes, João, João, você consegue encerrar a ah, compartilhamento do professor Mihail? Professor Mihail, uh, can you stop the the presentation? Your shared. Uh, I I close my presentation. Uh, no. And can you stop your shared screen? In the end of the Zoom screen. Just press the bus the, the button shared screen. Mm. It says, okay, I will close my session and then go back. No, but you, you have to close your screen, your computer. Uh, I, I think that in Zoom, here. I cannot see the, such possibility. Mm. That's okay. Uh, maybe we have uh, another way. João, você está aqui com a gente? Oba. Okay, what about okay, now? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. perfect, Professor. Thank you. Yes, yes. Computers like uh, violence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about this, please. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. I have so many questions to you, but I think you will have to listen to Professor Amalio from University, uh, Pontificia University of Sao Paulo. Uh, please, Amalio. Professor Amalio, we can hear you. A gente não cons... Ah, acho que agora seu microfone está aberto. Pode falar. Desculpe. No, no worry. Quero agradecer muito a Irene pelo convite, ao Douglas por toda todos os trâmites, não é? Pela organização. A USP e saludos a mis compañeros de hoy día. Julieta, Alexei e Mikhail. Sempre é, me impressionou a capacidade do Lotman de aumentar a complexidade da sua fala. O que culminou nesses dois últimos livros, não é? 
Então, quero agradecer também a Irene por, por nos ter apresentado este livro tão rico. É difícil é, fazer um roteiro do Lotman, porque ele diz cada coisa de maneira um pouco diferente é, dentro dessa tendência de aumentar o nível das complexidades. Então, a gente tem que tomar cuidado para não ser injusto com ele. Então, a minha ideia, como está no meu resumo, é de é, observar em que medida as teorias do Lottmann servem às análises da América Latina e do Caribe. Há um aumento contínuo da ideia de expansão, mobilidade e multiplicação dos trânsitos dos textos da cultura dentro dos espaços semióticos. Em Lótimo, e isso é acrescido pela importância que ele dá aos trânsitos de periferia. Que aumentam em muito os espaços de traduzibilidade. É muito importante que é, ele tenha cada vez mais falado em traduzibilidade nesses dois últimos livros. Isto porque é, a América Latina, na verdade, é uma grande periferia, não é? Ela não só é periferia dentro dela mas ela é uma periferia das periferias, porque Portugal e Espanha eram periferias da Europa. Então, todos os repertórios e línguas que chegaram aqui vieram, inclusive, de povos que já eram periféricos dentro da Europa, não só da Península Ibérica. Quer dizer que é, a, a colonização da América Latina e do Caribe por todos, esses, por todos esses povos constitui, por si só, um evento histórico explosivo. Não há nada de gradual nisso o que não quer dizer que, dentro dessas características tão extensas de intersecção de vários níveis, não haja aqui e acolá fenômenos de imposição gradual. Mas, então, eu estava dizendo o quão importantes são os aspectos da, disso que é, Lotman chama de traduzibilidade, que inclui é, espaços de intraduzibilidade e espaços de tradução incorreta e de tradução incompleta ele vai desenvolvendo em todos os seus em toda a sua em toda a sua trajetória e nesses dois livros mais ainda não é então vou tentar agora compartilhar algo aqui com vocês vamos ver se eu acerto isso hein? não não acertei ainda Amálio, você tem de ir no compartilhar tela. 
É, eu, eu compartilhei. Ah. Deixa eu ver. Vamos voltar aqui. Compartilhar. É, não estou conseguindo. Tenham paciência, por favor. A gente vê sua tela, professor. Uh, só não vê ah. o seu PowerPoint. Agora sim, estamos vendo o seu... Conseguimos, não é? Sim. Sim, o sim. Seu... Mas o senhor que... pode clicar na... Isso, no... no, no... Ok. Perfeito. Ah, ele saiu da reunião. Acho que ele caiu. Trabalho. Ele está entrando, vamos ver se ele entra. Ele está com a gente. Nós vamos vendo que o Lotman, é lentamente, ele foi, digamos, de alguma maneira, acertando as contas com o formalismo, e aumentando a importância das imprevisibilidades que devem ser, de alguma maneira, observadas pela, pelo fenômeno da tradução. Isto aparece, por exemplo... quando ele cita o Tiniano. Para mim, talvez, é a figura entre os formalistas mais próxima do Lottin. O Lottman diz, Tiniano escreveu, a época da decomposição de tal ou qual gênero, este se traslada do centro à periferia, e, em seu lugar, das miudezas da literatura, de suas circunvizinhanças e baixios, emerge no centro um novo fenômeno. Este mesmo processo se poderia descrever como a constante conversão do extrasistêmico e sistêmico e ao revés. Isso mostra... É, como Lotman vai é, desenvolvendo esta, este gosto pelos trânsitos de periferia. Mas a gente nota ainda aí algo que tende, de alguma maneira, ao dual. A ideia de centro e periferia, mais ou menos ainda colocadas uma frente à outra, ainda que haja a possibilidade de reversão. Diz ele depois, o formalismo foi o primeiro a fazer desse momento de transição, essas reversões do velho ao novo, um objeto de estudo, criando uma atualização das camadas periféricas da cultura. É necessário, no entanto, dar o próximo passo 
e enfatizar que não é qualquer extrato inferior, previsível, que se torna a fonte do novo, mas sim um conjunto, às vezes altamente heterogêneo, que às vezes pode conter elementos totalmente aleatórios. A gente nota aí como ele é cuidadoso é, com relação às modificações, ao dizer que não é qualquer extrato inferior previsível que se torna a fonte do novo, ou seja, não é um elemento isolado, trazido à tona, sem se observar o conjunto, que, pode, que, é, que contém elementos totalmente aleatórios, não é ele separadamente que pode constituir o novo. É, este é um exemplo que eu colhi, entre muitos que ele menciona, é, para mostrar como deve é, se considerar com cuidado as inovações. Nessa outra citação aqui, aparece algo que nos interessa muito, a mim, no caso, pelo menos, não é? As culturas cuja memória se satura no fundamental, com textos criados por elas mesmas, a maioria das vezes se caracterizam por um desenvolvimento gradual e retardatário. Ao contrário, as culturas cuja memória torna-se periodicamente objeto de uma saturação massiva, com textos elaborados em outra tradição, tendem a um desenvolvimento acelerado. Não há dúvida para mim que é, é o que acontece com as nossas culturas que são compostas por materiais múltiplos, divergentes e convergentes, trazidos de toda a parte do mundo e misturados às tradições afro-árabes e aquelas dos indígenas. Ele continua dizendo, falando da importância das situações periféricas, as esferas da cultura em que os fatores casuais desempenham um papel mais considerável são, ao mesmo tempo, os setores mais dinâmicos da mesma. É completamente evidente que o terreno do surgimento ativo dos textos casuais está situado na periferia, nos gêneros marginais, nos gêneros mais jovens e nos domínios estruturais fronteiriços. Aqui, precisamente, tem lugar os mais ativos processos geradores de sentidos e estruturas. Isto ele vai desenvolvendo de maneira cada vez mais forte. É, ele culmina, na minha opinião, ainda que em vai e vem, não é uma sequência linear, ele culmina as afirmações que faz sobre a importância do surgimento de textos na periferia, nesses dois últimos livros, onde, inclusive, ele é, menciona de maneira muito interessante a quantidade de terrenos minados nesse setor, ou seja, como... Há muitas minas sempre por explodir, que seriam estes textos que estariam é, esperando ser descobertos e estão soterrados. Situa-se situa aí também outra coisa muito importante para mim em Lotman. Ele, aqui e acolá, nestes livros em que ele ditava não é? o que queria, porque a sua saúde já não permitia é, escrever, ele acentua a importância 
do que ele chama de situações de linguagem que não se transformaram em texto. Como se houvesse um grande território de passagem em que o que ele chama de sistema modelizante secundário não se perfaz, porque estão numa espécie de é, fronteira entre o semiótico e o extra-semiótico. Isto é um outro, é um outro nogórdio a ser desenvolvido. Não é? É, queria parar aqui um pouco para falar é, Vou tentar voltar hein, para a companhia de vocês aqui. Consegui. É... Eu queria falar de novo da tradução, do processo de tradução. É... Falar de tradução nos processos culturais apenas não é suficiente. A tradução é aquilo que pode relacionar textos diferentes e transformá-los em uma outra coisa em andamento que possibilita múltiplas interpretações. Estou falando é, meio que parafraseando a linguagem é, do Lótimo. As intersecções, quando bem realizadas, elas possibilitam múltiplas interpretações. É, inclusive, isso é mais forte ainda se é, a quantidade de textos em relação é assimétrica. Inclusive, é interessante a maneira como... A Irene é, privilegia a simetria na sua introdução, tendo em vista que é, a América Latina teve sempre que lidar com, te com textos assimétricos, vindos de todas as partes. E o Lotman termina por dizer que a estrutura pensante se realiza melhor na medida em que consegue colocar em ação relacionalmente estes textos assimétricos, que contém um nível alto de indeterminação. Isto se a tradução for realizada a contento. Então, não basta falar em tradução, porque, senão, não há possibilidade de conexões interculturais. Dois textos que estão próximos um do outro não foram ainda traduzidos. A tradução também pode ser, como diz o próprio Lottmann, repetindo, incorreta. Este é um outro nogórdio a ser conversado. Eu digo isso porque o Brasil tem uma tradição notória, muito forte, de tradução. Principalmente o Brasil de tradução poética, não é? Como sabemos. Quem trabalha muito a tradução, essa tradução que poderíamos chamar de intercultural, quando bem realizada, são é, certos autores cubanos. Alejo Carpentier, Severo Sarduy, Lesama Lima, são, digamos, especialistas, ainda que não o digam, nessas formas de tradução cultural, que são traduções intersemióticas da cultura, incluindo... É, o ambiente das ruas, as festas populares, nessa linha. Isso mais ou menos que é, vinha fazendo a nossa é, 
não esqueci da professora Jerusa Pires Ferreira. Este é, este é um outro problema central. É, me permitam ler para vocês a respeito um texto do Severo Sardui, que poderá dar mais conta do que eu estou falando. Se esta tradução não é realizada, se não sabemos o que é ela, não temos condição de imaginar uma sociedade solidária em torno dos seus objetos. Quer dizer que a tradução, nesse sentido, ela tem uma importância ética, estética, evidentemente, e política também. na medida que é essa... Quando bem realizado esse espaço de traduzibilidade, ele promove a complexidade interrelacionada da cultura em que os habitantes se situam. Em meio aos objetos da cultura. Isto, para mim, é muito importante. É, diz, por exemplo, o Severo Sardui, a língua dos conquistadores, o castelhano, é como uma fachada de uma igreja barroca em Havana, em Taxco ou em Minas Gerais. As linhas gerais, a composição, inclusive os beirais evolutas, são, sem dúvida, europeus mas os índios foram trazendo das minas ou das plantações onde trabalhavam, ou de suas aldeias à beira-mar, junto com os negros, mulatos e imigrantes, pequenos detalhes, coisas belas, cheias de colorido, decorativas, que engastaram encadearam, enxertaram nessas fachadas. Por isso se pode falar de um barroco mineiro ou açucareiro. Em qualquer caso, a fachada, por força de acréscimos, converte-se em marchetaria. Em português, marchetaria também se diz talxia, seria taracea em castelhano, que vem do verbo incrustar, bordar. Em proliferação de signos, em reflexo de cores e formas. O mesmo sucede com a língua. Desde a conquista até nossos dias, lhe foram enxertando novos ornamentos, palavras e rodeios não usados antes. A língua pele velha e ressecada revive graças às tatuagens, aos desenhos feitos com tinta, às cruzes e às cobras, como os das fachadas do barroco colonial. Este é um exemplo muito claro, como tantos outros, de como pode-se realizar, através de determinados procedimentos, de enxerto e proliferação de materiais, a tradução entre elementos desconexos e assimétricos, que, no caso, assimilam o barroco europeu e se transformam num barroco latino-americano, ibero-americano, ligado ao ambiente natural. Os exemplos seriam inúmeros. Há algo aqui, voltemos ao, é, a esse negócio que eu não estou conseguindo fazer. Ah, felizmente. 
É... Já tínhamos lido isso. Agora eu queria pular esse aí para ler depois e é, dizer algo aqui também bastante importante. Nas sociedades, isso está já em tá no cultura e explosão. Nas sociedades de cultura oral, se conservavam e transmitiam de geração em geração imensos extratos de informação que se apoiavam tanto sobre uma refinada cultura coletiva como sobre cada gen da memória. A escritura tornou supérflua uma parte considerável de tal cultura. O Lotto me fala isso mais de uma vez. Tem um certo momento em que ele fala na perda, inclusive, da é, mnemônica, que é, ou seja, a arte e a técnica de memorização. Ora, como todos nós sabemos, o que aconteceu na América Latina e no Caribe foi que as oralidades e a voz se mantiveram de maneira radical. Não há obra é, dita de vanguarda, para usar o termo é, costumeiro, não há obra dita de vanguarda que não tenha se valido dentro da sua construção de elementos é, provenientes das múltiplas oralidades que se localizaram vindas de todos os lugares na América Latina e que se multiplicaram com a presença indígena em todos os países da América. Isto unido, evidentemente, a todas as oralidades vindas da África. A ponto do Flusser dizer, isto é bastante importante também para mim, que é, o idioma que se fala no Brasil não é propriamente flexional, a não ser quando ele é usado de maneira linear, como princípio, meio e fim. Ou seja, o idioma, quando é usado... É, dentro da sua linearidade fascistoide. É, na verdade, ele disse o idioma que se fala no Brasil, quando bem usado, é um idioma aglutinante, em virtude da quantidade de termos em que toda essa marca oral se aglutina. Nem precisamos aqui citar... É, figuras tão importantes como é, Guimarães Rosa, que, é, numa famosa entrevista que deu para o seu tradutor, dizia eu aprendi a escrever com as histórias que meu avô me contava. Histórias do sertão. Esse é um território também onde Jerusa atuou muito e que lhe possibilitou é, estudar as traduções dos contos russos no sertão, as traduções de Puskin no sertão, que eram os que sempre continham, em virtude do acúmulo de elementos oralizantes múltiplos, sempre continham uma guinada humorística, paródica, erótica ou rítmica. Isto que estou falando assim em catadupa, é tudo, é, é, precisa, precisava se dar muitos exemplos, mas isto é fundamental. Então, todas as mitopoéticas medievais foram traduzidas para o nosso território de tal maneira que essas mitopoéticas deixaram de ser uma repetição cíclica, isso que menciona também o Lottmann, não é? Ao falar das repetições cíclicas. Elas deixaram de ser uma recepção, repetição cíclica para se serem uma incorporação tradutória, que inclui uma guinada perceptiva. Não podemos deixar de observar 
isto. Muito bem. Por isso que ele diz aqui, depois, processos cíclicos e que evoluem gradualmente não levam a situações imprevisíveis. É, os nossos é, processos cíclico-mitológicos levam a situações imprevisíveis sempre. Em virtude, como já mostrou o Lessama Lima, por exemplo, fartamente, vocês devem conhecer a, a, o livro Expressão Americana, que foi traduzido e selecionado pela Erlé Marquemp, é? é, em que se mostra o quanto os mitos latino-americanos se mesclaram com os mitos medievais e se transformaram em outra coisa. Eu trouxe aqui um exemplo sobre isso, um exemplo que eu chamaria de um exemplo singelo. Professor aqui... Armando, Oi? eu gostaria de pedir, é, a, a, com o um exemplo que o senhor está apresentando, perguntar se o senhor já estaria se encaminhando para o encerramento da sua palestra, a gente já... Não me diga, a... já passou isso tudo? <risos> já, a gente já passou os 40 minutinhos. Eu ter... 40 já passou? Eu não teria cinco para rapidamente? Claro, claro, teria sim. Me desculpem, é, é, eu, eu teria muita coisa para dizer. Imagina, eu estou falando de improviso justamente para não ocupar o tempo, um tempo grande. É, me desculpe, olha aqui. Então, esse é um exemplo de um candomblé que foi coletado por Alejo Carpentier. Então, tem um canto, não é? Oleli, olalá, oleli, olalá, que é um elemento visivelmente vocal e coletivo. Resso Cristo, transmissor. O transmissor aí, é, 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 conforme um erro popular, um erro operativo, não é? ele é transformado em sol para rimar com ol, o OL do oleli, olalá. Oleli, obatalá, transmissor. Oleli, Allan Kardec, transmissor. Se reparem a facilidade para aproveitar o fundador da parapsicologia, porque o nome dele também pertence aos esquemas sonoros, que são importantes aí. Então, há o elemento de é, mitologias é, variadas, não é? católica, africana, e Santa Bárbara transmissor. Oleli, olalá, oleli, olalá. E isso tudo é cantado num esquema de festa. Não é? As mulheres com os seios de fora, etc. É, eu só queria, então, é, já que o meu tempo acabou, falar que é muito importante como o Lotman desenvolve com preocupação no, nesses, dois, nesses seus dois últimos livros, a passagem da diade à tríade. Tendo em vista essa complexidade dos territórios em trânsito nas periferias, ele percebe que a diade ela não é mais suficiente e ela pode recair numa oposição alternativa, que pode ter, ele diz, consequências catastróficas. O interessante é que ele, é... ao dizer isso, ele coloca um problema que é, é muito interessante. Aqui no meio... Ele diz, não obstante, não se pode deixar de destacar a particularidade do momento. É isso que tem o Lótimo de dizer coisas pequenas e importantes no meio de uma frase. A própria passagem é pensada, a própria passagem do binário ao ternário, não é? 
a própria passagem é pensada dentro dos conceitos tradicionais da binariedade. Isto não é brincadeira. Significa um risco, não somente estético, mas político, da gente querer caminhar para o ternário, que, claro, seria uma abertura maior, mas a partir do binário, o que nos deixaria, de alguma maneira, epistemicamente encurralados. É, eu acho que isto ocorre demais nos dias de hoje. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, professor Amário. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, according uh, with a suggestion of Irene, we can uh, take a round of questions for the first uh, guests. Uh, well, uh, someone have questions to do to Professor Amalio and Professor uh, Mihail. Uh, if someone have questions, can be open the mic and, and do. Um, we have some two questions in chat. Uh, the both to Professor Lotman, uh, so we can start to uh, answer this. Professor Lotman, are you agree? Yes, I am with you, always. Okay, okay. The first question is from Ekaterina Volkova. As, um, Can we see the Russian aggression towards Ukraine as an explosion? Uh, do you think we can expect some positive results from this explosion? Uh, yes, uh, of course, the explosion. It was absolutely un uh, unexpected for many people in, I don't know, uh, in Russia, in Ukraine, in, uh, especially in Europe. Um, actually, American president uh, predicted this uh, development, but it was ignored. And so uh, we, are, uh, we are in constant contact with our Ukrainian colleagues, and they say, no, 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 it's uh, not possible. So it's, it's explosion. The whole status quo is completely destroyed. And not only in the relation of these two countries, it's um, uh, in uh, a very uh, broad sense explode the, uh, the international uh, law order, though, and it uh, establishes um, many new challenges, for example, what will be happened after the war, how uh, the war criminals can be uh, uh, prosecuted, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Ms. Volkova asked, uh, can we expect some good results? Yes, we can we are always hoping for good results, but Uh, Rick, that's the uh, uh, no, that's the essence of explosion. We cannot predict the uh, uh, results. There are many. Uh, uh, um, there are some optimistic view, both from Ukraine, for uh, for Russia, and for international society. Some some middle way, and uh, it can be a very bad uh, result, and uh, one of the worst result that there will be not result that this war will escalate to a global nuclear war. This possibility is also open. So, Thank you. And the, 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 now, what I say now, it's not a word of semantician. I say it as politician. <laughs> and I, I usually, I don't uh, mix these two roles, but Uh, the question was uh, political, more political than semiotical. Okay. Well, uh, the second question uh, to you is mine. 
uh, well, in some point of your lecture, you said that the past keeps uh, guidelines for the future, including the possibilities of the flooded moments. Uh, and in your other point of your question, uh, of your lecture, uh, you questioned that uh, what in history could be true and what in the history or the past it's, it was really true. Uh, so uh, it's re reverberating to me right now. And my question is, how can this paradox can create a, uh, an explosive moment? And uh, the other question is, are the explosive moments always happen in a duality or in a binary of, uh, in the culture? Yes, I, um, according to my father's uh, book, the explosion uh, is the result of the logic of uh, this duality. Uh, there are no tertium non datum. There are no neutral positions. So uh, you are um, oscillating between two uh, I am not sure that the situation is so. <laughs> is it the paradox is here that uh, un unpredictable situation is predicted, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's also a kind of a paradox. Um, I think that uh, nothing is predicted, and even uh, un unpredictability is and cannot be predicted. Uh, so, and what does the first part of the issue about that? Uh, the true past. Uh, yeah, what the, uh, you see, your, what was the logic of uh, Pasternak and uh, Schlegel? Uh, that uh, the research of uh, past is kind of prophecy. It's not, uh, uh, so you, and uh, we can also say that, oh, that's, uh, I know this fact, that's a revelation. The revelation is not uh, an, an empirical uh, result of empirical work. Uh, um, uh, so the, and, um, uh, my point was that the border between natural sciences and uh, humanities is not so solid and not so predeterminant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Douglas, uh, I have one more question to Professor Mikhail. Can I? Of course. Uh, I'd, uh, thank you very much for a brilliant uh, presentation. But is so. Uh, I think that uh, I have so uh, some doubts about the uh, different difference between uh, the truth and variety. Uh, according to the, uh, the text, uh, the historical fact of Yuri Lotman. Uh -huh. uh, I asked you uh, that when uh, Lotman uh, study, studies uh, historical fact as the uh, truth, uh, and uh, according to uh, science of history, this is the only, the only unique possibility to understand the historical fact. Which kind of, uh, of uh, uh, concept of a truth is a variety or truth uh, according to uh, your presentation? Please. Uh, you see, what I presented, it's not my terms. It's a, uh, I think it's misleading terms in the, uh, what I call the Russian culture. And of course, you don't uh, make distinction between variety and the truth. Truth is. Uh, uh, you can, uh, even in uh, humanities, you can verify the truth, and that's very important. Uh, uh, about the semiotics of fact, uh, that uh, that was that's very important uh, uh, issue in uh, Tartu Moscow semiotics school. What was the classical situation? First, we will establish the facts. And then we started to interpret them. Uh, for example, uh, we are archaeologists, or uh, some we are uh, looking for the facts, and uh, then we establish. And then comes to the historian and said what these facts means. Uh, uh, in different structural world, 
facts, not only by your lot, but by, for, for example, for Michel Foucault. The fact is not the beginning point, the starting point. You can go into the fact through discourses to the reconstruction uh, and um, the coding languages, uh, discourses, and, and so on. You know, the fact is not the starting point, but the uh, product of research. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Mihaiu. Uh, we have another question uh, for Professor Amalio from Silvia Bari. Uh, professor, ela perguntou aqui no chat se é possível pensar em situações imprevisíveis no caso de culturas orais transmitidas pela tradição ou por tradições. Obrigado pela pergunta, Silvia. É... Uma das capacidades da cultura oral é que ela não é apenas digital, ela é muito mais analógica. É, toda a cultura oral ela se compõe de elementos de, do que se chama tecnicamente de traços suprasegmentares, ou seja, entonacionais, silábico-acentuais, ou seja, prosódicos. Então, na América Latina, houve não só um processo de grande mescla sintática e lexical. Houve também uma mescla prosódica. Isso significou mudança de tonalidades e ritmos. Isso não pode deixar de ser visto dentro do processo da cultura, senão você perde uma parte enorme dessa cultura. Não é? Então, por isso que grandes poetas da América Latina ligaram a sua poesia é, verbal, é, ligaram as suas escrituras à dança e é, à música local e a toda essa gama de entonações e modificações rítmicas, que, que são o conjunto das possibilidades de existência, inclusive das classes maltratadas e perseguidas. Se você não vê, não observa a grandeza ética e estética das artes populares, por exemplo, na oralidade, você está cometendo um erro político grave. Não é? É, porque, evidentemente, é, desse modo, aquela poesia colocada pelo Mikhail vale para nós, não é? Não se pode conhecer o Brasil, Cuba, Argentina de modo intelectual apenas. Existe algo que está na respiração, ou seja, no tom, e não se capta isso através do verbocentrismo. Então, a resposta, é, minha cara Silvia, é a seguinte, não há dúvida nenhuma que é possível pensar é, em situações imprevisíveis, é, no caso das culturas orais. Talvez elas possam, inclusive, comandar as situações imprevisíveis, como diz o Lottmann, num dos lugares do seu trabalho. O Lottmann diz claramente, muitas vezes uma língua que estava soterrada pode ocupar um espaço enorme dentro da cultura. Não há dúvida que, para nós, a é, a cultura oral ela tem este fundamento. E ela depois passa para o mundo audiovisual, não é? Passa para o mundo das telenovelas. Ela habita também o folhetim, sempre habitou o folhetim, a crônica. Então, ela tem uma capacidade, como diz o Zuntor, de nomadismo enorme. É, o Zuntor, inclusive, chama de culturas em estilo rápido, aquelas que têm... É, em ação os elementos da cultura oral. Mais ou menos isso. Obrigado, professor Amaro. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, we don't have more questions, so we can move for the next two lectures, if you all agree. I'd like to, to, to ask you to people if you need a break because we can break for 10 minutes if you like i don't know 
what people uh, think about. Please, but you can put in the chat if you need. Epigon is us, agreed. Because for us, it's possible to, to go to go on. Take a break, okay, Alexei? Alexei, yes, Catherine. Important for you? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 10 minutes, please. And oh, 11 to any, <laughs> we come back. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon, people.
Irene, essas novas perguntas no chat a gente responde depois ou agora? Como é que é? Uh, podemos deixar para depois? Assim... Como quiser, como quiser. Bom... Você, você só aguarda, porque provavelmente surgirão outras. Né? Tá certo, tá bom. Podemos recomeçar? Podemos. We can start again. Ok. Uh, so, let's start. Uh, thank you. This, uh, for... And Semeneko, let's say. In this, uh, this section, we have two conferences. The first is Professor Juliette Aida. She uh, is a professor of the Mexico Department, Department uh, Escuela Nacional de Antropologia e Historia, the Universidad de México. She is one of the, of the most important students student or research in the field of complexity and semiotics. And I think that her lecture today will deal about this, this theme. Uh, the lecture uh, today is about Yuri Lotman, cutting edge proposals between complex and, trans and the transdisciplinarity spirals. Uh, professor Julieta, please. Ok. Eh, en primer lugar, yo quiero agradecer a Irene por la invitación y a todo el equipo de organización, un gran equipo que trabajó mucho, con mu mucho sudor. <ríe> y ahora estamos en ese evento eh, que participo con, con mucha emoción. Creo que es muy importante, por eso agradezco mucho la oportunidad Yo soy brasileña, pero hablo portuñol y voy a hablar en portugués, en español. No en portugués porque ya tengo 50 años fuera de Brasil. Un poco más fácil para mí el español ahorita, porque mezclo un poco. Agradezco mucho entonces a la oportunidad, Irene, a todo el equipo. Creo que es una, una, un excelente momento para compartir algunas ideas con ustedes. Voy a compartir a, el PowerPoint. Você vê bem? Irene? Sim, Julieta. Sim, sim. Perfeito. Ok. okay. Eh, então, eh, la, o tema de hoje é Juri Lotman, eh, a exposição Proposta de Vanguardia entre Espirales Complejas e Transdisciplinárias. Em eh, essa, essa exposição, em essa ponência, em homenagem a Juri Lotman, emblemático intelectual en el campo de la semiótica, relacionamos su profunda producción con dos grandes epistemologías críticas de vanguardia, la complejidad y la transdisciplinaridad. En primer lugar, colocamos algunas premisas de las dos epistemologías y, y en segundo lugar, relacionamos los planteamientos y las categorías de Judy Lotman con las epistemologías mencionadas para establecer puentes analíticos con los procesos cognitivos emocionales contemporáneos. Eh, los núcleos analíticos de la exposición son cuatro, eh, la, la epistemología de la complejidad y de la transdisciplinariedad, principales premisas, la semiótica de la cultura nuclear frente a otras semióticas, tercero, el bucle impredecibilidad, incertidumbre en las ciencias naturales y en las ciencias de la cultura, y cuatro, de la semiótica de la cultura a la semiótica de la cultura digital. Eso con la idea de colocar eh, la obra de Jill Lotman en la discusión de vanguardia del siglo XXI, epistemológica, porque creemos que tiene varios puentes importantes en ese sentido. ¿no? Además, también destacar la semiótica de la cultura de, de Lotman frente a otras semióticas y trabajar el núcleo de, de, del seminario de... De, de, que, o sea, del tema de, del congreso o del seminario de, de ese coloquio, que es el buque de lo, de lo impredecible, de la impredecibilidad, que también se traduce como imprevisibilidad. Imprevisibilidad, sí. Entonces, en primer lugar, tenemos las epistemologías de vanguardia, que algunas solo voy a mencionar, y, solo, y después me detengo en dos. 
É, creio que é importante colocar que nesse momento, no siglo XXI, é, em todos os tipos de, de trabalho, de investigação, em todos os tipos de, 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 de investigação de docência, é importante colocar um diálogo, é, por lo menos seis epistemologias. É, porque eu creio que a complexidade que, que estamos vivendo e as dificuldades que, este, que temos na civilização e nas culturas, nesse momento, é, pedem pedem né, esse, esse diálogo. E o diálogo é entre as epistemologias ancestrais, a epistemologia da complexidade, a epistemologia da transdisciplinaridade, a epistemologia da decolonialidade, a epistemologia do sul e a epistemologia materialista revisitada. É um diálogo que eu creio que, que tem sua dificuldade, mas que é importantíssimo assumir, não? Uh, em todas as perspectivas que temos agora, uh, para desenvolver uh, os processos de conhecimento sobre toda a problemática que, que existe civilizatória e mundial. E essa epistemologia se observa uh, planteamentos críticos frente às hegemônicas, que possibilitam novos caminhos para reflexionar e para propor uma nova civilização, uma nova humanidade, mais allá do antropoceno. É, presenta as seguintes características generais. Em primeiro lugar, assumem a necessidade de reconhecer todos os processos cognitivos que se desenvolvem em todas as culturas, os de Ocidente e os de Oriente. Segundo, se situam em la vanguardia porque aceptam vários tipos de conhecimentos, não só o irracional, sino também o emocional, o mítico, o mágico, o intuitivo, o práctico, o artístico. Terceiro, propõe escenários distintos, relacionados a um pensamento crítico, em onde se defende a igualdade de todos os seres humanos, de todas as culturas, e propõe, propõe abrir caminhos para superar todo tipo de dominação e de justiça. Coloca na dimensão ética como fundamental para lograr superar os obstáculos e as contradições da humanidade e das civilizações atuais. Abrem caminhos de convergência e de diálogo entre múltiplas dimensões da complexidade humana. É, estão as epistemologias ancestrais, não vamos a parar, porque se me vai todos os minutos, não posso parar, estão as e depois então, paramos na epistemologia da complexidade, que seriam as duas que vou a, a, a detenerme um pouco, não? A epistemologia da complexidade que, que, que colocamos depois com as categorias de Júri Lottmann em diálogo, e creemos que é importante porque se move um pouco as categorias não, de Júri Lottmann e se amplia um pouco a, el, a sua capacidade ou, ou o alcance analítico de, de as categorias lottmannianas. Então, a primeira premissa da complexidade é que se trabalha com a incertidumbre, o impredecível, o imprevisível. Eh, en ese sentido, yo creo que hay que detenernos un momentito rap rápidamente, porque la traducción eh, en español es, es impredecible, aunque también mucha gente usa lo imprevisible, y eh, creo que es un problema de matiz si uno coloca la atención en el decir o en el ver, ¿no? Es un problema de, de, de matiz. Y también la, la relación de la categoría eh, o de ese proceso de, de, de lo impredecible en relación a la incertidumbre y en relación a la teoría del azar. Yo creo que es interesante eso porque son categorías que vienen de las ciencias naturales. Vienen, por ejemplo, lo impredecible de, de la química de Ilia Prigogini, eh, al cual eh, Lotman menciona en su obra y lo reconoce, de la química de la complejidad. Eh, también viene a incertidumbre de, de, vem de la física, quando plantean e na física quântica que não é tão, 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 tão certo que, que, que todas, as, to, todas as partículas físicas se movem como planteava antes a física clássica, não é assim? E também a teoria de Lassar, uma biologia, por exemplo, de Jacques Monod, e, e, e na década de 70, e em França, e também Prêmio Nobel em, em Biologia e também Maturana e, e Varela, onde plantea que há uma teoria de azar também na Biologia. Então, essa reflexão desses processos é interessante porque surgem nas ciências naturais e vão às ciências da cultura. Isso é interessante, não? Quando, quando o Lottmann 
sistematice esas categorías y esos procesos de lo impredecible que después vamos a, a trabajar un poco. Segunda premisa es, en la comunidad, es lo dialógico, lo recursivo, lo hologramático. Son principios fundamentales que también está, por ejemplo, en la obra de Lottmann, muy interesante trabajando con Bartín, la categoría de, dialógica, que tiene su estatuto analítico muy importante, ¿no? Y eh, las otras categorías que yo, yo creo que también entran en diálogo y ayudan en el análisis de la cultura. También en, la, en términos de la cultura tenemos la entropía, la negentropía y la recursividad en todos los sistemas complejos, en donde está el desorden, el orden, la interacción y la organización. Y ahí tenemos el bucle tetralógico que plantea Mohan, unidad analítica nuclear relacionada con la espiral cósmica, con las espirales en, la, en lo micro y en lo macro. Y la espiral, eh, además de ser una metáfora y un símbolo y una figura retórica, tanto en lo visual como en el discurso, eh, es una base que tiene el ADN. El ADN, el movimiento del ADN de toda la materia viva es en espiral, en una doble espiral. Por eso es interesante esa, esa, cuando Edgar Morin usa la metáfora cognitiva de la espiral y del bucle, ¿no? que es una espiral. De, después, otra premisa, los sistemas complejos son abiertos, recursivos, retroactivos, relacionados con la autoecoorganización viviente. Y la lógica de lo contradictorio fundamental quiere decir que en todos los fenómenos está lo antagónico y lo complementario al mismo tiempo, principio también presente en el taoísmo. La lógica de lo contradictorio es una lógica interesante que de alguna manera también está presente en la, en la producción lotomaniana, la, la contradicción, porque hay que, hay que colocar que la contradicción no, no corresponde a la oposición estructuralista binaria, eh, que tuvo su influencia en algún momento en la obra lotomaniana al inicio, pero la lógica de lo contradictorio es eh, de, otro, de otro carácter, es una contradicción importantísima que no es eh, que sea negro, blanco, vida o muerte, sino que son las dos de manera recursiva y contradictoria y complementaria. ¿no? Esa, entonces no es el binarismo, sino que es la contradicción. Una categoría filosófica y lógica mucho más compleja que el binarismo. Y, de, y lo último, la última premisa es pe, pequeñísima síntesis ¿no? que estoy haciendo. El sujeto complejo que es transdimensional, contradictorio, en movimientos recursivos, horizontales, verticales, diagonales, que es el homo complexus que plantea Edgar Morin. Un, un gran aporte en términos del sujeto eh, para analizar el sujeto en la cultura, ¿no? que de alguna manera eh, también es importante. Después de la epistemología de la transdisciplinaridad, eh, que son los dos, eh, además de otros, son los dos grandes eh, exponentes de esas epistemologías críticas, ese es Basara Brincolesco, de la física cuántica, eh, que plantea eh, esas premisas también de manera sintética, plantea, se plantea los niveles de realidad del objeto, que son las dimensiones global, regional, nacional, local, lo macro y lo micro, los niveles de realidad del sujeto, las distintas formas de percepción que se configuran en la subjetividad y en la transdimensionalidad del sujeto. Y la relación sujeto-objeto recursiva todos los subjetivos y objetivos y viceversa, que es la premisa eh, de vanguardia y crítica contra la posición cartesiana positivista de que hay una separación entre el sujeto y el objeto y hay una separación del conocimiento objetivo con el conocimiento subjetivo. Eh, todas esas, esas premisas en, en, en el cual de alguna manera estuvimos inmersos o estamos también inmersos, tenemos que tomar cuidado porque en general eh, la gente dice, ¿no? que la ciencia es el conocimiento objetivo frente a otros tipos de conocimiento que existen, que son tan importantes como de la ciencia, como a, a algunos conocimientos de, mágicos y míticos desarrollados en las culturas ancestrales de África, de Asia, de América. Y después el sujeto y el objeto son transdisciplinares para Basara Bincolesco, ligados a la transdimensionalidad, a la transrealidad, categorías muy importantes, y a la transsubjetividad. El tercer incluido el tercer oculto, presentes en el paso de los niveles de realidad del objeto y los niveles de percepción del sujeto. Y la transculturalidad, que es muy interesante, muy importante, que introducimos y hacemos en diálogo, dialogar con las posturas de, Lot de Lotman, como un proceso articulado orgánicamente con la transdisciplinaridad, 
donde juega un papel medular los niveles de realidad y los procesos dialógicos. Es importante de, de, de decir que y, y na, eh, en la exposición vamos a destacar la, la transculturalidad más que la interculturalidad y vamos a hacer el diálogo de esa categoría como un proceso importantísimo, incluso en términos digitales, con las posturas de Jill Lottmann, justamente extendiendo los hilos, ¿no? extendiendo los caminos que abrió Jill Lottmann. La epistemología de la decolonialidad y del sur no vamos a parar, la epistemología materialista revisitada no vamos a parar. Y el segundo punto es la semiótica de Lotman en relación a las otras grandes semióticas. No quiere decir que aquí se agota el campo de la semiótica. El campo de la semiótica eh, tiene primero una primera sistematización en 1968 con Humberto Eco, eh, por supuesto, y con otras, otras tipologías también de, del campo de la semiótica y, y el campo que, en donde se plantea la discusión, por ejemplo, que no podemos parar ahora, pero que es interesante, dónde empieza lo semiótico y dónde, ter, y dónde termina lo semiótico. Sería muy interesante también una discusión en términos cognitivos, pero en eso no vamos a parar. Pero aquí vamos a colocar algunas de, 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 la, de los ejes o de las tendencias pilares del, del campo de la semiótica en el siglo XX, ¿no? Y que sigue en el siglo XXI, en donde queremos ubicar la importancia de Jury Lottmann y la importancia de, de la difusión de, de, de esa tendencia que, que se pudo hacer gracias a la traducción de Desiderio Navarro, de la obra de Jury Lottmann al español, y otras traducciones del francés, otras traducciones del inglés, y el trabajo de Manuel Cáceres con la revista Entre Textos, también difundiendo la obra de Jury Lottmann en español. Entonces, aquí lo que vemos es que eh, también un diálogo, como planteamos el diálogo de la epistemología, aquí también planteamos desde la complejidad y desde la transdisciplinariedad la necesidad de un diálogo. O sea, nosotros no planteamos eh, desde la complejidad y de la transdisciplinariedad que excluimos eh, las tendencias o excluimos autores, ¿no? sino que eh, más bien es una posición de de la complejidad, de la transdisciplinariedad, de hacer un diálogo convergente entre las varias tendencias. Entonces tenemos Saussure, que todo el mundo conoce, estructuralismo que, que, que implica una estructura inmanente, Peirce, la lógica pragmática semiosis como lógica, que también tiene una intertextualidad con la obra de Lottmann, Julie Lottmann, el materialismo y otras tendencias, una semiosis como cultura, Voloshinov, el materialismo no ortodoxo, semiosis como ideología, Resnikov, un materialismo, la semiosis como cognición, Bartín, materialismo también no ortodoxo, semiosis narrativa. Y en todas esas semiosis, lo que, lo que queremos decir es que la obra de Julie Lottmann se sitúa como uno de, yo diría que una de, de las tendencias de mayor amplitud junto con la de Peirce, porque es una semiótica que abarca todo, ¿no? Es una semiótica que, como todos, ve, todos vemos, abarca toda la producción textual, pero el texto más allá del discurso verbal, el texto como cultura, toda la categoría de texto es una categoría muy trabajada, y yo creo que es una categoría trabajada de manera transdisciplinar en Julie Lottmann, y por lo tanto la, eh, las dos grandes tendencias que yo creo que del siglo XX que tienen fuerza ¿no? y persisten es la de Julie Lottmann y la de Peirce, pero con el diálogo con las otras, Voroshinov es muy importante, Bartín es importante, Resnikov es importante y Saussure, ¿no? Y Saussure también no podemos decir que no, más allá de las limitantes que tiene. Entonces, en esa semiótica de Jury Lottmann encontramos la, la importancia de, de su producción en diálogo con las otras producciones. En todo ese escenario, Jury Lottmann constituye y funda la escuela de Tartu, más allá de Occidente y de las exclusiones que sufrió sin dejar de recurrir a la intertextualidad cognitiva con los otros, para proponer planteamientos importantes que hasta ahora subsisten, son vigentes y retomados en muchas investigaciones. En sus varias etapas de producción, siempre existieron superaciones importantes, entre las cuales mencionamos algunas, no más, algunas, la categoría de semiosfera, la categoría de texto que he mencionado, el sistema modelizante primario y secundario, por ejemplo, cuando él coloca el sistema modelizante primario de la lengua y del espacio, que es muy interesante destacar eso, porque no es solo la lengua, es la lengua y el espacio, 
e depois todos os outros sistemas secundários, e o problema, por exemplo, que tratou o companheiro Amálio da de, de tradução, que tem que ver com a tradução cultural e a tradução que nós estamos de, de, de tradução transcultural. A memória da cultura é muito importante, a dialética do predecível e impredecível com e nos processos culturais explosivos e graduais, que é a influência de Igia Prigogini, químico da complexidade. A produção de Lótima é uma obra incomensurável, com a fortaleza das grandes teorias e que, em termos prospectivos, tem todavía que difundir-se muito, destacamos algumas reflexões derivadas de seus planteamentos. Eh, algumas reflexões. Os sistemas e as práticas semióticos discursivas que conformam a la cultura humana estão sujeitos a uma lei obrigatória de desarrollo por el dinamismo de las relaciones sociales, históricas e políticas. A la luz de las propuestas lotmanianas, esa premisa abarca otros factores de cambio, como son las relaciones interculturales y que ahora nosotros preferimos eh, usar transculturales, que es una categoría que viene de la, de, de la complejidad y de la transdisciplinaridad y muy sistematizada por Basarab Nicolescu. La dominación cultural que pueden producir transformaciones profundas, como son ejemplos actuales, os, os fenômenos da globalização política, econômica e cultural, relacionados de maneira ineludível com a cibercultura, o cibertempo, o ciberespaço e o ciberantropo. A globalização implica trabalhar desde a transculturalidade, a heterogeneidade dos movimentos dialéticos das fronteiras semiótico-culturais, que implica na tradução cultural, intercultural, transcultural e, por lo tanto, os cambios culturais. Claro, todo o problema de la, de, de la tradução e, e, todo, e toda a dimensão, todos os tipos de tradução, todos os tipos de tradução nos diferentes campos cognitivos, com a maior dificuldade de la tradução no arte, não? principalmente no arte, porque para traduzir uma metáfora, um símbolo, ou os tropos, está, está, está a loucura, mas eh, é possível certo grado de tradução para que se haja compreensível entre as culturas. Não? E eu creio que o processo dentro da globalização, da transculturalidade digital e todos os software que há para a tradução já ajuda muito eh, es, es, esses problemas da tradução que, que sabemos que existem. Não? Atualmente, a globalização só existe para uma pequena parte da humanidade, e a heterogeneidade impõe o desafio de conservar a diferença frente à la homogeneização. Desafio complejo porque nos encontramos com duas possibilidades. A possível redução das culturas da periferia a nível global e local, que passam a ocupar os espaços nucleares do centro. Há muitos movimentos nesse sentido, não? muitos movimentos. O movimento dialético da periferia ao centro, que plantea tem, de maneira tão brilhante Júlio Lótoma e na semiosfera, é um movimento que ocorre mais além da hegemonia, mais além da exclusão que quer ser a hegemonia, ocorre, não mais que quando vai ao centro, eh, cambia um pouco o sentido e cambia um pouco a semiótica mesma da periferia. Mas tudo isso é um trabalho de processo interessante que se pode, que se pode analisar, não ou com o, o bueno, dos, 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 dos possibilidades, ou com o oposto, a destruição das culturas que se situam fora do centro e na periferia. E isso sim ha ocorrido muito na história da humanidade, não? As culturas da de periferia desaparecem, pois. Desaparecem junto com elas suas línguas. Terceiro ponto, o bucle da impredecibilidade, da incertidumbre, em las ciencias naturales y en las ciencias de la cultura, vamos a quedar más en las ciencias de la cultura, aunque ten, tenemos lo otro como cosa. Entonces, los planteamientos de, de Juli Lottmann tienen que ver con esa dialéctica de lo predecible e impredecible en los procesos culturales y se relacionan de modo importante con la complejidad y la transdisciplinariedad. Aquí voy a poder tomar un poco las, las premisas, ya que todo, mucha gente conoce de lo predecible e impredecible, muy trabajado en los libros que, de, de la cultura de exposición y, y el proceso de impredecibilidad que plantea Júlio Lottmann en sus últimas, últimas obras, pero aquí lo que quiero de, colocar es que mmm, yo pienso que desde la complejidad y la transdisciplinaridad uno prefiere usar una recursividad entre lo predecible y lo impredecible más que una oposición, ¿no? 
O sea, donde hay impredecible, no hay lo predecible. Porque el mismo Lotman dice que algo que es predecible puede tornarse impredecible dependiendo de, de la coyuntura, de desarrollo cultural, de desarrollo histórico. En fin, es un punto de, de reflexión y de análisis que podemos eh, retomar. Sobre ese tópico de, de, la, de lo predecible e impredecible, eh, consideramos las siguientes premisas. Con base en lo que Lotman plantea sobre la cultura, la, la no cultura y la anticultura, es posible ampliar y proponer una semiosfera de la cultura, de la no cultura, de la anticultura. Un bucle en el cual se materializan los movimientos de lo impredecible y de lo predecible. Influencia de, ya dijimos, de Prigogine. Aquí lo, también lo que, te, lo, que, lo que preguntamos no es, no es el, el problema del huevo y la gallina, ¿eh? sino que lo que preguntamos en, en la rapidez y en, en los cambios efímeros, dinámicos, eh, profundos o menos profundos de, de los procesos culturales en la globalización y en el mundo digital, lo que uno pregunta, mmm, pre, de, dejaría la pregunta, ¿no? Eh, tenemos más, más bien procesos impredecibles o predecibles. Yo creo que eh, en esos momentos, a partir de la misma pandemia que, que tuvimos, yo creo que los procesos son más impredecibles que predecibles. ¿no? Por ese movimiento fuertísimo que hay en relación a la, al desarrollo cultural, en relación a la globalización, en relación a lo digital. Bueno, la segunda premisa son las relaciones entre lo impredecible y lo predecible que ocurren en varias dimensiones de la intrasfera, que es decir, dentro de una semiosfera, y en las tres intersemiosferas, que es de la cultura, de la no cultura y de la anticultura, con lo cual emergen nuevos ángulos analíticos. Tercero, esos planteamientos implican considerar el dinamismo de estas semiosferas de modo recursivo y continuo, lo que había dicho, ¿no? Más que de oposición, como lo plantea Lepic en 2008. Eh, en ese sentido, la heterogeneidad de los tipos de semiosfera conlleva a introducir conflictos entre ellas. O sea, hay un problema de, de, de teoría de conflicto que yo creo que en la um, obra de Lotman a veces desaparece. ¿no? El problema del poder y del conflicto eh, no, es, no, no emerge de manera fuerte en, la, en, en el análisis de las semiosferas en el análisis de los movimientos internos y externos de, de las semiosferas. Ese es un punto que, que, que tendríamos que, eh, que ampliar pues, en, la, en la obra del otro. Eh, cuarto, los procesos culturales explosivos implican ruptura, cambios, mientras que los procesos culturales graduales proyectan una continuidad en la dinámica cultural. Además, los procesos exclusivos se articulan con lo impredecible y los graduales con lo predecible. Esta dialéctica recursiva da cuenta de los movimientos en espiral de la cultura, en todas sus dimensiones. Este planteamiento es homólogo a las relaciones recursivas de la complejidad y de la transdisciplinaridad. Quinto, en las últimas reflexiones, Yuri Lotman integra más la teoría de la incertidumbre para analizar situaciones preexplosivas de caos, dinamismo, Cambios. Lo impredecible se ubica en un abanico de posibles cambios con múltiples consecuencias, como ha pasado con las guerras, como pasa con la pandemia, como pasa con varios procesos actuales. ¿no? La, incertidumbre, la incertidumbre, todo acontecimiento de impacto no solo abre nuevos caminos, sino que trunca otras posibilidades del futuro. Sexto, en el libro Cultura y Explosión, Lotman plantea que los dos procesos se combinan simultáneamente en las siguientes áreas, discurso político, en lo moral, en la moda, en el arte, en el deporte, en las guerras, en los movimientos sociales, históricos, culturales, políticos. Entonces, eh, eh, pensamos que eh, eh, es interesante, importante, eh, que de, de Prigogine se salta de, la, de lo impredecible en la química y la complejidad, se, salta, eh, se pone en la categoría, como decimos, ¿no? migra la categoría, migra eh, una categoría migrante, de las ciencias naturales a la ciencia de la cultura, que Lotman lo hace de manera brillante. Y, y creo que es interesante porque justamente esa impredecibilidad está tanto en las ciencias naturales, como dijimos, en la química, en la física, en la biología, y también en las ciencias culturales. Eso, eso es interesante, la relación eh, justamente 
de que habíamos dicho de, de, la, mate, de la materia vive, viva en el sentido de, de, de los movimientos de la materia viva, del ADN, que es espiral, impredecibles y que pasan para la cultura, la, la sociedad y la historia. Eh, séptimo, en síntesis, el mismo acontecimiento puede ser insertado, según Lotman, en la serie impredecible o en la serie predecible, lo que proyecta características a la dinámica de la cultura. En consecuencia, se destaca una dialéctica de la contradicción compleja. Esa es una dialéctica importante para introducirse en los análisis, ¿no? que es impredecible y predecible al mismo tiempo. Es, esa es la premisa mmm, del antagónico y complementario al mismo tiempo, tan repetida por Edgar Morin en sus seis tomos del método. Y que eh, es difícil, la, la verdad, eh, si, si tenemos el pensamiento estructural todo, en todo el siglo XX, es difícil, tarda un poco para que uno pueda colocar esa lógica de la dialéctica de la contradicción, esa lógica de la contradicción que lo antagónico y complementario se da al mismo tiempo, porque en el, en el estructuralismo el binarismo separaba pues, los, los polos opuestos, y aquí no. Y aplicando a lo, a lo, a lo otro, tenemos que es impredecible y predecible al mismo tiempo. Es una premisa y una perspectiva que había que retomar. Set, octavo, eh, en los movimientos socioculturales, históricos, políticos, nosotros destacamos los movimientos de la diferencia como un ejemplo, ¿no? los cuales generan muchas producciones culturales materializadas en prácticas semióticas discursivas, como son las marchas, la semiosis de los cuerpos, las mantas. Esos movimientos y sus formas de manifestación son más impredecibles que predecibles. Los movimientos de la diferencia, las alternativas se sitúan en la periferia, lo temaniana, pero pueden moverse al centro de la semiosfera. Cuarto punto, la, de la semiótica de la cultura a la semiótica de la cultura digital. Eh, en primer lugar, me, me, eh, es importante, yo creo, detenernos en, en la, la, la revisión de, de lo, la tipología de las culturas que tiene Lotman en sus varios escritos y que no, no, yo creo que ese cuadro no, estaba, no está es, es visual, pues todo el mundo ha, ha, ha leído, pero no está visual eh, esa, esa oposición que, ta, que establece Lotman en sus obras. Es interesante la tipología de la cultura para comparar, comparar con otros autores y otras tendencias de la tipología de la cultura, porque hay muchos trabajos en eso, pero lo otro tiene una variedad muy grande, ¿no? Cultura no cultura, cultura contra cultura, anticultura, la cultura extra cultura, cultura de centro hegemónica, la cultura periférica alternativa o de resistencia, cultura textual, cultura de código, cultura de expresión, cultura de contenido, cultura oral, ágrafa cultura escrita, cultura visual y cultura postvisual, invisible, cultura digital o cibercultura. Eh, entonces vamos a ver primero el cronotopo en la semiótica de la cultura. En la semiótica de la cultura, el espacio aparece como el, el segundo sistema modelizante primario después de la lengua. Con este planteamiento, Lotman puede ilustrar muchas concepciones ancestrales que obedecen al homeomorfismo entre las construcciones espaciales y el cosmos. Además, el espacio-tiempo obedece, el cronotopo, Bartín, obedece a regularidades canónicas que cambian la conectitud. Son más duraderas, más duraderas. El ser humano ni el ser humano. Los, el ser humano, los sujetos de ese cronotopo, viven de modo totalmente distinto a los de, de ahora. Las vivencias y experiencias tenían límites espacio-temporales especiales. En otras dimensiones del mundo cuántico, con varios tipos de realidad, tenemos otro tipo de, de, de cronotopo espacio-temporal. Y ahí, cuando, cuando articulamos y, o insertamos lo que plantea Basarab Nicolescu, desde la transdisciplinaridad y de la física cuántica, y de Lupasco, cuando él plantea niveles de realidad que colocamos cuando expusimos la epistemología, de Basarab Nicolescu, así como la transrealidad, que va más allá de la categoría de realidad, ¿no? Y, y, y todavía más cuando él problematiza la realidad y lo real. Eh, después el, cono, el, el cronotopo y la... Sí, falta cinco minutos. Cinco minutos, please. Bueno, dame, de, dame ocho. Oh, bueno, ok, ok, ok. Voy un poquito más rápido. La semiótica de... El, el cronotopo y la, y la semiótica de la cultura digital. La semiótica de la cultura digital produce cambios importantes en el cronotopo espacio temporal con los desa desarrollos de las sociedades contemporáneas. 
Los sujetos son obligados a asumir coordenadas espaciotemporales de forma distinta. Los sujetos tienen que enfrentar otras dimensiones de realidad. La hiperrealidad, como plantea Baudrillard, ¿no? en la cual desaparece la realidad misma. Todo es cambiante, efímero, líquido de Bauman, con una rapidez antes no imaginable. Desde la complejidad a la transdisciplinaridad se asume la explicación de esos ritmos espacios temporales, recurriendo al continuo cognitivo entre las ciencias naturales, las ciencias sociales, las ciencias matemáticas y las ciencias artísticas, que es un continuo convergente de la complejidad y la trans transdisciplinaridad, que también está presente en, en varios trabajos de Giulio Lottman. ¿eh? En varios trabajos de Giulio Lottman, uno, uno ve el ejemplo que él coloca del arte como como la producción prístina de la semiótica. El ser humano se transforma en un cibernantropo, Lefebvre, demasiado dinámico, rápido, un cibernauta sin límites de espacios temporales que vive en un mundo de incertidumbre de lo impredecible y de los fake news. En el paso de la semiótica de la cultura, de la cultura digital pasa lo siguiente, la posibilidad e imposibilidad de traducción entre las dos semiosferas, las categorías que pueden ser traducidas y adecuadas, las nuevas categorías que deben ser construidas para abordar la semiótica de la cultura digital, donde se encuentra el ciberantropo navegando en el cronotopo digital del ciberespacio del cibertempo. Esta traducción intersemiótica compleja establece la necesidad de reconstruir y de construir nuevos modelos analíticos, nuevo desafío para el campo de la semiótica en el siglo XXI. Los sujetos ciberantropos el ciberespacio, el cibertempo y la producción postvisual generan procesos complejos que rompen las fronteras semióticas, introduciendo nuevas pautas de relación entre la realidad, la escritura, lo visual, lo postvisual y lo invisible. En la semiótica postvisual, lo cibernético visual se abre un mundo inconmensurable de producción, de sentido, de nuevas visualidades, de postvisualidades que emergen y obligan a la adaptación de nuevos canales sensoriales perceptivos. La semiótica de la cultura tiene categorías pertinentes para abordar esas nuevas producciones desde una semiótica compleja, porque Lotman en su trayectoria pasó de la interdisciplinaridad a la transdisciplinaridad y su en la última etapa de su producción. Por último, ya estoy terminando, la obra Lotmaniana ocupa un lugar emblemático, fundante en la historia de la semiótica, que permite reflexionar desde sus fundamentos sobre los nuevos escenarios de la producción semiótica discursiva digital del siglo XXI, como son las producciones 3D, 4D, así como los algoritmos, los metaversos y los caminos fascinantes y peligrosos de la inteligencia artificial. Muchas gracias. Debo de compartir. Muchas okay. gracias. Muchas gracias. Julieta. Gracias. And now, let's go to Alexei Semenenko, thank you for coming. Hello. For us. You. Hello, I'm listening to you. Okay. Alexei Semenenko is professor of, of, at the UMIA, uh, I don't know if it's the correct pronunciation, University in Sweden. <laughs> um, his field of research is Russian culture and the contemporary media. And today, He is, uh, his lecture is about unpredictable is human, Lotman and history, uh, and history and human symbiosis. Thank you very much, Alexei, please. Yes, thank you. Um, you can see my PowerPoint. Yes, 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 perfectly. No problem. And it works. Okay. okay so well. thank you very much for. Uh, invited me to this conference. Uh, it would have been, of course, great to, to be in Brazil, but I understand this is, this is the best way we can do. It. And it's, it's very nice to, to see all, uh, all, all the faces that I knew only in writing before. So I understand this is a very long session with uh, three languages, many accents. So we will, I will keep it short. I'll try. Um, it, of course, overlaps in many ways with uh, the, the first presentation by Mikhail Lotman, and I will, of course, skip some of the parts that he covered. My uh, 
intention here is to talk about the uh, the principle of unpredictability as one of the key concepts in human uh, in Lotman's semiotic theory and how it applies to the key concepts in, in his theory and how we can use it in, in our studies of culture. So uh, I always like to begin with, with this uh, portrait of uh, Lotman by a, a Swedish photographer, uh, <clears throat> which I included also in, in my book. So let's go to uh, June 1988. Uh, when in Stockholm, there was a conference dedicated to culture, language, and artificial intelligence. A lot of participated in this conference with a talk, Semiotics and the Historic Process, which later became an article, Semiotics and the Historical Sciences, yeah, in Russian. Uh, <clears throat> one would wonder why history and methodology uh, would have something to do with artificial intelligence. But we will come to this point a little bit later. So while presenting this paper, uh, I of course apologize for the quality of the screenshots because they are from the VHS uh, tape, which, which, which I have from this Congress. It's, it's all uh, very authentic. So, uh, while presenting this paper, uh, among other things, uh, Lotman stated, it's not for the sake of the paradox that we can say that the past never passes. It is an ever-changing matter. This idea is repeated in, in quite uh, a few texts by, by Lotman later, but that was a crucial point for Lotman. In many ways, this view was opposed to the accepted dogma of the Soviet deterministic history studies that depicted history as a linear process, ideologically predetermined and logically explainable. Uh, this view is shared by quite a lot of historians nowadays that in, uh, if we have a logical uh, explanation of the events of the past, then we can, of course, predict the future, and then we can uh, explain and plan for the today's, uh, for, the, for the today's history. A uh, lot more explored the idea of indeterminacy of the past and the unpredictability of the historical processes in several papers, and uh, putting forward more or less the same thesis. Unpredictability is an essential feature of human semiosis that lies at the core of all cultural processes. Here is another shot. Uh, an unprepared reader can easily be confused by the references to hard sciences and such scholars as Vernadsky or Prigozhin and the conceptual nomenclature in Lotman's work. Uh, system, aggregate, process, mechanisms, apparatus. Even the semiosphere evokes some kind of uh, met metaphysical uh, structure which uh, is not uh, rooted in the biological or cultural uh, uh, core of uh, our semiosis. So all these uh, concepts uh, may suggest that Lotman focuses on some something impersonal, systemic entities and laws, which is also uh, the case uh, in, in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but it is, of course, very far from the truth. One of the core principles of Lotman semiotics was the, uh, ent the unity and the a reciprocal relationship of all semiotic entities from individual consciousness to whole cultures and the semiosphere. We will come back to that uh, point a little bit later. But this connection makes unpredictability not just an external factor, but an intrinsic feature of human culture. Quote, predictability doesn't exist, not in the history of mankind, not in the history of culture, despite several thousand years of experience, uh, asserts Lotman already in, in, the of the, uh, in the end of the 70s and the 80s. Uh, 
Unpredictable processes are important for the vitality of culture. Another quote, if the system did develop without these unpredictable external intrusions, uh, so that it would form a unique enclosed structure, then its development would be cyclical. In its ideal form, it would represent a continuous repetition. And uh, that, of course, echoes uh, his contention that the dialogue is not possible if we, if we don't have any tension between the ad addresser and the addressee. It is not some, some kind of ideal sphere of language in which we exist and communicate without any problem. But it should have some kind of tension, some kind of untranslatability in order for the communication to occur. Uh, he famously says that if we have two uh, people who understand each other 100%, they would not have anything to talk about. Let's continue. In other words, if culture were totally predictable, it would become redundant and unusable because it would cease to function as a meaning generating mechanism. Uh, this is just uh, a scheme to, to demonstrate how Lotman develops these uh, contentions in his theory in, in different texts, but it come, boils down to these uh, oppositions, if, if you will. Uh, so if we are talking about uh, human semiosis, and that was the, the core uh, of, of Lotman's theory, uh, then we uh, can differentiate between our semiosis and uh, animal uh, semiosis in these uh, uh, simple uh, dichotomies. Uh, and as we see, unpredictability lies at the very core of all of these uh, oppositions. Not only it, only, uh, it uh, distinguishes human semiosis uh, by these qualities, but we have a, an intrinsic uh, conflict between these qualities in human semiosis as well. Uh, there is always the desire to be predictable, to create structures which are easy to follow and understand and predict. In, in human culture. And at the same time, we always uh, come across the un unpredictable uh, events in all spheres of culture. And uh, like we uh, discussed in, in the very first um, uh, lecture, uh, war is, is one of them. And it disrupts and creates explosions in practically all the layers of culture. So if the development of culture is always to an extent unpredictable, how can we analyze its past? And uh, well, I, I will skip the... Uh, the part where he uh, cites uh, Friedrich Schlegel's aphorism that a historian is a prophet who predicts the past and all the uh, context that is connected to it. It is uh, important here that a lot more problematizes the, 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 the concept of a retrospect, because the retrospect is the tool for, for us to make the events of the past logical and predictable in the past. This is what happens when we do not count, and it is, of course, impossible to count all the possible outcomes of certain events in the past because they didn't happen. It is uh, possible to uh, muse, it is possible to uh, conjure possible effects, but he, as many historians uh, like to say, there is no uh, conditional in, 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 his, in historic sciences. So uh, that problem of the retrospect, uh, the impossibility to predict something at the very point of uh, explosion, but the desire to explain what happened 
by the power of retrospect is also uh, one of the characteristic features of um, our culture. Uh, another quote, history stands before us not as a rolled up ball of endless thread, but as a cascade of spontaneous living matter. Within this, uh, that cascade, there collide mechanisms designed to increase entropy and as a result, limit choice reducing alternative situations to an, inf to an informational zero. And the mechanism designed to increase the number of alternatives, that is the moments of choice, moments when it is impossible to predict the course of development. Here, the intelligence and personality of the individual come into play in making the choice. As a result, human intelligence not only passively reflects an exterior reality, but it uh, is also an active agent in the life of history and the universe. Hence the historical and universal roles of culture and the collective intelligence of humankind. And this is of course, one of the points which echoes back to the uh, Soviet uh, era where the question of the uh, importance of a personal uh, of, of, of a personality in historical processes was always discussed. We can back, go back to Leo Tolstoy's uh, famous work, War and Peace, where he uh, contends that history is this kind of impersonal process, uh, uh, deterministic process, which is impossible to meddle with. It just envelops and all the people are in history as the poems and all the attempts to affect this process will lead only to you know, personal and uh, global disasters. That was, of course, the, the, the opposite view of uh, development who shows that in the moment of the explosion, uh, culture behaves itself as a person, as one uh, person. And it is not only, it, it should not be uh, accepted as a, as a simple metaphor, we see that in the uh, critical catastrophic events, it is exactly the power, the will of very few people who affect millions. Uh, and still in, in the 21st century, it is, of course, very sad to, uh, uh, to confirm um, this idea that the uh, historical process often comes to the will of the few, which affects the, uh, the fate of the millions. So continuing with the uh, approach, how in, in what kind of way, if we cannot really rely uh, on uh, the power of retrospect to explain what happened, if we cannot really talk about the past from our point of view, how can we, what kind of methodology should we develop to analyze the past? On that conference in uh, 1988, uh, Lotman stated directly that we probably don't have the methodology to analyze all the aspects of the cultural development and, uh, um, and historical development. Uh, <clears throat> the concept of explosions probably came from the same problem that the explosion should be uh, not only uh, shouldn't be viewed as a as a kind of uh, abnormal event in in our historical development but it should be viewed as something which is intrinsic to our uh, semiosis. Uh, it is not therefore a coincidence that uh, Lotman attempts to outline a different approach that would take into account unpredictability as an inherent uh, factor of historical development. And in his uh, uh, two last books, he focuses on, uh, on, on that aspect. Uh, so another quote, each time we speak of unpredictability, we have in mind a specific collection of equally 
probable possibilities from which only one may be realized. In this way, each structural position represents a cluster of variant possibilities. Up to a certain point, they appear as indistinguishable synonyms. However, movement from the point of explosion causes them to become more and more dispersed in the in semantic space. Finally, the moment arrives when they become carriers of semantic differences. Uh, that is quite an important, uh, probably it is stated in, in a little cumbersome <laughs> manner, but the idea of the uh, cluster of variant possibilities, which can be viewed as synonyms, that, that means that you cannot see the difference between these possible paths at that point. But furthermore, you would see how they diverge and in, at certain points they become very different from each other. This idea that we have to differentiate between the scale of things in the explosion is quite an important uh, idea and it is also very uh, characteristic for our time because in, in many spheres, we are exactly in, in the core of the explosion. We experience in, experiencing this explosion as we, as we speak, and we also try to distinguish this kind of nodal points in the explosion and uh, trying to predict how these paths would uh, uh, envelop uh, in, in the future. Uh, that is why it is very important to, to focus exactly on the meta uh, sphere of, of, of these uh, musings, how we actually reflect on our choices right now in the explosion. Not when in, in two years, in five years, in 10 years, when we explain everything what happened right now as a very logical and absolutely de deterministic linear way. But uh, we take into account these points of nodal, these nodal points of different possibilities. Uh, it is rarely described. It is rarely remembered. It usually, it is usually forgotten because, like Lockman said, uh, and like we all know, the power of retrospect wants to have a logical and rational explanation of what happened. But uh, that's why they they disappear from from the memory but uh, from the collective memory. But it is one of the most important, probably most important um, questions that Lotman uh, emphasized when he's speaking about history as, 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 uh, as science, historical science. So it is important to note that uh, the concept of unpredictability should not be also uh, confused with uh, such terms as uh, improbability or indeterminacy, which is used in hard sciences and mathematics and physics and so on. Although, of course, many of these, uh, this uh, nomenclature was borrowed from Prigozhin, for example, so it was borrowed from hard sciences, from Vernotsky and, uh, and others. Um, unpredictable shouldn't also be confused with uh, random and chaotic. It is also important because the, the cultural processes are not the small particles in, in, in space. <laughs> uh, another quote, unpredictability, unpredictability should not be understood as constituting a series of unlimited or undefined possibilities for movement from one state to another. Each movement of explosion has its own collection of equally probable possibilities of movement into a sequential state beyond the limits of which lie only those changes which are frequently impossible. Again, it, it, it is worded very heavily, uh, the, but the point here is that and Lotman comes to the uh, point of the importance of choice in, in historical processes because as we uh, have discussed, it boils down to people who make these choices. The prob the, uh, so the, there is no metaphysics, there is no uh, uh, systemic power which you know, governs us and makes us uh, make these uh, choices. But, the, uh, but history 
although there is always a, a, sometimes a need to explain that as, as a very systemic and very predictable event. Uh, like I said, it's always this kind of tension, tension between these you know, collective explainabil explainability and the personal uh, unpredictability and, uh, or choice. So the conscious choice of thinking individual human psychology becomes a factor of cultural and historical development. And this idea comes as early as uh, uh, 1985. Uh, <clears throat> when, uh, and even earlier when, when Lockman was discussing uh, these different approaches to artificial intelligence, now we come back to the, to the question of artificial intelligence. And he questioned the very kind of uh, ethos of, uh, of the already in the 60s and the 70s of creating of replicating human consciousness in the machine by uh, problematizing the the very essence of it uh, he writes in, in several articles that if we really want to uh, replicate our consciousness in a machine we would not use this machine because this machine would be very uh, if, if, uh, unusable because this machine would uh, forget things that this machine would uh, have a possibility to go insane this machine would act as an individual that is with all the flaws which we actually try to eliminate when we uh, create machines all the machines which we Great, they have a perfect memory, they have a perfect predictability, and if they behave in, in a different way, then there is a mistake, there is a, an error in the algorithm which should be corrected. So the very uh, idea that uh, there is some kind of mechanistic core to the human consciousness that we can replicate in, in a computer, for example, uh, which was uh, popularized by, by many other semioticians, including uh, Ivanov uh, and so on. So uh, this, this idea that the human consciousness can be replicated in this kind of mechanistic way uh, contradicted the very essence of what uh, should be conceived of uh, human consciousness, personal and collective. Uh, this is my last uh, slide, so uh, you can just uh, relax for, for a little bit, so I will, I will soon come to, uh, to the uh, finish, uh, of, to the end of my talk. Um, just to remind, these are the key concepts of uh, Lotman's history, uh, Lotman's theory, and as you can see, unpredictability lies implicitly or explicitly in, in pretty, uh, pretty much all of them. The idea of cultural isomorphism is that we, uh, the, the personal uh, consciousness uh, is just uh, one in the chain uh, of other consciousnesses and um, can be analyzed and, and culture can be therefore analyzed in, in the same way. Doesn't mean, uh, because it is quite often confused with this a total uh, uh, predictability and uh, deterministic uh, explanation of, of culture. That doesn't mean that uh, culture and personal uh, consciousness are identical. They are isomorphic. That means, but for Lotman, that there are these kind of boundaries of different level, which create tension between these levels, which create meaning. This is the very key of the of culture as a meaning generating mechanism. The very idea that uh, the second one, uh, the very idea that uh, culture can be uh, viewed as as a uh, as a generator of text, and uh, different cultures can be compared as a very uh, uh, very general invariant text. That uh, uh, contention also comes from the from Lotman's thesis that this is the system is not the primary semiotic mechanism. It is the text which creates dialogue that creates 
languages that creates cultures. The texts are the essence of uh, human uh, culture and the idea that these uh, uh, texts can be interpreted in different ways, again, creates the uh, possibility for different interpretations, the tension and the uh, um, and new meanings. The concept of auto communication, which is very important for, for Lockman and uh, for the uh, uh, dichotomy of the myth texts and plot texts, but uh, for the myth as as uh, not just a very simple narrative structure, but as a type of consciousness. And we can also see that, that in uh, the times of uh, cultural explosions of the uh, total unpredictability, the mythological uh, level of our culture comes to the surface. This is what we can almost, uh, it becomes so palpable that we can almost feel it. Um, so auto-communication as, as a, uh, if we view it from the, uh, from the point of view of non-human semiotics, is absolutely senseless. Uh, creating the text which you communicate with uh, many, many times, not gaining any new information because the texts are not functioning as a, a, a source of information. In that kind of uh, scheme, it, it functions exactly as a, as a, as a mechanism for uh, self-regulating mechanism of the self. And this idea that the text can function in these both ways is also very important. Again, create intentions between them. Uh, the very idea, of course, and the, these two points, the polyglot consciousness and the translation, they go together. And translation, of course, uh, is very important for all of these uh, concepts, including unpredictability, goes uh, hand in hand. The translation and the unpredictability goes hand in hand in uh, um, human semiosis because this is what actually moves forward, which creates non-cyclical structures for us um, and results not only in the multiplicity of different languages that we use and the multiplicity of science systems that we use, but the need of different science systems, multimodality of our communication and the continuous creation of new texts and new languages Although it would uh, contradict the very idea of communication, yeah, the transfer of information, but this avalanche of new science systems and, and texts um, is the very essence of our uh, cultural development. And finally, the concept of the semiosphere, which uh, is also often uh, understood very metaphorically or uh, confused with, for example, Hofmeier's and understanding of semiosphere, just the totality of the science systems of all the biosphere in 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 the world, including the uh, you know amoebas and I don't know uh, extraterrestrial communication, possible extraterrestrial communication. For him, uh, for for, for Lotman, it was very concrete. The semiosphere was this, was the totality of human culture, also very. Uh, directly connected to our cultural isomorphism. So this uh, human understanding of the semiosphere is very important for him because the asymmetry and heterogeneity of our semiospheres not only uh, makes a workable model of uh, our human cultures, but also works as a methodological mechanism because in order, and here we come back to the to the very first question, how can we can analyze the past? Um, Lovna shows in, in many of his texts that, that an, uh, uh, in order to understand one text, factual or not factual, historic or uh, you know, truthful or so, and so on and so on, 
the the very idea is to attempt to reconstruct the semiosphere sphere of this text in order to get uh, to the understanding of this text in that particular time uh, and not the, the other way around when we have the text and try to make sense of it from our retrospect position. So uh, I think this is the uh, a good conclusion to, to this uh, talk. And I just wanted to reiterate that unpredictability uh, as an essentially polyglot uh, structure in our semiosis is reflected in all levels, both from individual texts to cultures and to historical processes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alexei, and now let's go to the questions. Uh, we have a question to Julieta. Uh, Julieta? Tem uma para eu responder antes, não é, Irene? You 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 would like to to answer now? Claro. Não estou de Não, não me incomodo que Julieta não, responda não. antes. É que quando eu falei antes... Não, não, não. não. Sorry. Entendeu? Ok. Posso falar, então? Yes, 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 please. É, graças por la pergunta. Javier. Sim, se pode compreender um discurso de las periferias, como un intento de liberarse de los autoritarismos fascistoides en la sociedad. Pero el riesgo sería que éste se transformara en un otro discurso único y no complejo y se perdiera su capacidad de composición de relaciones que me parece lo que Lotteman eh, concluye como siendo lo más importante. Cuando se trata de un habla oral, el habla oral no tiene apenas significado, o sea, la parte semántica. Esta parte semántica se transforma a través de la voz que está en todo el proceso físico, performático, la voz llega a la naturaleza y en la naturaleza pasa por el lenguaje acústico del paisaje, incluyéndose ahí los vientos, las mareas, los animales, etcétera. O sea, la voz es un pasaje de la semiosfera a la biosfera. Entonces la voz y el habla oral tienen la gran complejidad de relacionarse, por un lado, con las otras lenguas, orales o no, y por otro lado, ella está penetrada de naturaleza. Estos son estudios que ya han sido hechos, hechos desde los primeros cientistas que vinieron a América, como Humboldt, Marcius, por ejemplo. Ya, esto es muy importante. Eh, no por casualidad, Goethe, a Goethe le encantaban tanto los pesquisadores que eran amigos suyos, como Humboldt y Marcius. Entonces, eh, tenemos siempre que tener el cuidado de, por amor a la necesidad de liberarnos de todo el fascismo, que no caigamos en, una, en un otro aislamiento y una exclusividad con su propia totalización hipostática 
y eh, idealizada y substancialista. Así podría conversar contigo, Javier. Gracias. Gracias, Amalio. Uh, we have another question to Julieta. Mm. ¿Cómo se articula lo emocional con un tipo de conocimiento, con, uh, como un tipo de conocimiento, con los factores de cambio de la semiosfera desde la perspectiva del pensamiento complejo? Ya. Yeah. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, Silvia hace la pregunta. Eh, yo creo que recuperar esa relación recursiva entre la emoción y la razón es una, una ruta analítica del siglo XXI, que empezó al final del siglo XX eh, cuando, cuando la emoción eh, toma un lugar importante como la razón. Y, y, en términos de que antes la emoción era trabajada eh, por la filosofía y también por el arte y por otro, otros tipos de, de semiosis, y, 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 no era, y, y, y como la razón era la diosa, era el centro, entonces la emoción quedaba como la, el patito feo. En el final del siglo XX y del siglo XXI, eh, emerge de, de una manera interesante, aunque antes ya había psicólogos que trabajaban en la emoción, por supuesto, la zona de la emoción está muy ligada al campo cognitivo de la psicología, ahí está Vygotsky y todos los otros psicólogos, ¿no? que trabajan en la emoción y en la dimensión psicológica, pero eh, lo interesante es que adquiere una importancia cognitiva y epistemológica. De ahí está eh, el ejemplo de Goleman, la inteligencia emocional. Escribe la inteligencia emocional cuando dice la inteligencia no se agota en la razón, no, no se agota en la razón, sino que está la inteligencia emocional. Después hay otro con Gardner, que trabaja la múltiple inteligencia, en donde sale de la razón y va a las otras inteligencias, a los otros tipos de conocimiento. Entonces, en ese sentido, Silvia, es que la complejidad y la transdisciplinaridad, tanto Mohan habla de, ra, de la razón y la emoción en su obra, como Basarab Nicolescu también trabaja con la emoción y la razón, pero lo, la, la pone eh, con el mismo estatuto de categorías eh, cognitivas y de procesos importantes en la producción semiótico-discursiva. De ahí que, que en la semiosfera, por ejemplo, yo creo que justamente esa es otra línea que de algún, a, a, a veces está por la cosa del arte en Lotman, cuando, cuando, cuando Lotman recurre tanto al, al arte, a, a ilustrar los ejemplos del arte, eh, en el arte un, una premisa fundamental que, que la define es la emoción. Entonces, yo creo que en ese sentido eh, se articula, pues podemos sacar del discurso lotomaniano eh, esa importancia de la recursividad, razón, emoción. Y en la semiosfera, los cambios, y por ejemplo, en, la, en las marchas, todos los movimientos sociales, no, 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 no existen sin emoción. Todo el arte no existe sin emoción. Toda, um, que, yo, yo podría decir, podemos decir, si queremos expandir mucho, o ampliar, podemos decir que no hay prácticas semióticas discursivas sin emoción. O incluso la práctica del laboratorio, cuando se hace un experimento, está la emoción. Aunque en el arte es donde está el privilegio, pero no es lo único, ¿no? Cuando se hace un experimento en un laboratorio, está la emoción. Y cuando un cientista descubre la, las cosas, o la fórmula, o, o un astrónomo descubre en, en el universo las cosas, es sumamente emocionante y pasional. Y de ahí tenemos varios estudios, ¿no? Una, ya una bibliografía muy grande de, de la emoción, compitiendo con la razón, por supuesto. Entonces, en la semiosfera, yo creo que esa es una ruta que hay que retomar en algunas partes que no está considerada, ¿no? Ok, eso. Muchas gracias, Julieta. Uh, let me uh, ask it to Alexei. Uh, if we take Lotma's idea of not having methodology to all problems of culture, it is possible to say that methodology depends on, on uh, or is related to choice. This is my question to, to Alexei, but if you... Uh, you... Uh -huh. well, well, he, you know, it's probably 
uh, in in the beginning of that talk in in the eighties, he said that you know in order to fully uh, ask uh, answer all these questions, uh, which were very trendy at that time of cultural language and artificial intelligence all together. Uh, he gives a very, you know, honest answer that we don't have a methodology right now to answer these kind of questions because that was, if you remember, left brain, right brain. We just, you know, we can you build again. We will build a, a machine which will behave exactly as a human being. And then it was also quite a lot of speculations in semiotic studies that we have, you know, this kind of, you know, left hemisphere is responsible for this kind of, you know, uh, uh, linear and, uh, uh, you know, uh, plot-oriented uh, texts and the, the right hemisphere is, is more dealing with the, for example, emotions and so on and so on. And so if we combine these kind of, you know, two uh, mechanisms together, this will, uh, then we'll have our artificial uh, intelligence, uh, but um, I uh, then uh, what he actually did in his works was that uh, that analyzing you know different texts in the context of e each semiosphere and constructing all these models because usually you know if uh, Lotman or Uspensky are cited they are cited by these kind of you know conclusions to their can create analyses that they performed on different texts. And uh, it is not always possible to, you know, to generalize. Uh, but uh, I don't know, even his uh, commentary to uh, Pushkin's uh, Eugene Onegin uh, is constructed in such a way that there is a very long exposition of the semisphere of this time in order to, you know, try to approach the possible understanding of the usual you know readership of pushkin at that time and that is the the method not to uh try to understand you know uh, eugen and again from our point of view which is a very valid understanding but this is not the methodology this is just a you know a history of reception of, of a text through time so so I would say that you know his, his methodology is is based exactly on this uh, concept of semiosphere and unpredictability functions as a uh, not as a some some kind of external strange factor but an intrinsic factor of this development. So that that's the difference. Thank you, thank you, and uh, I have one more question to Amalu. Amalu, when you say that the voice is so important and, and she and it is uh, connected to nature. I think that the language of the colonizer uh, will be always intranslatable, untranslatable. What do you think about? And, 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 uh, your, your microphone, please. Sim, Irene, muito obrigado pela pergunta. Primeira coisa que é difícil encontrar um colonizador absoluto. Não é? Eu diria, imaginemos um colonizador que tivesse levado isso que Lotman chama de pensamento por rebanho, de rebanho às últimas consequências. Isso é muito difícil. Então, é, o que normalmente acontece é que o processo de colonização inclua momentos em que o colonizador ele é, é envolvido pelo colonizado. É, pensemos é, no José de Anchieta, quando realizava na colônia, no, no período colonial, o, um teatro barroco em que ele... É, que falava várias línguas, fazia um teatro em que se utilizava um latim decadente, é, o português, o tupi-guarani, 
numa espécie de momento macarrônico em que é, era praticado um idioma, uma, um teatro barroquizante. Não é? Então, é, é difícil... É, isso quer dizer que, enquanto todas essas atrocidades colonizantes eram praticadas na América Latina, ela tinha também meios de, em meio é, a isto, se autocolonizar. Não é? Eu acho melhor do que decolonizar, se autocolonizar. Não é? E é necessário, digamos, para os processos revolucionários, a gente observar os momentos de complexidade estrutural que se produziam em meio à colonização. Então, é, havia também o barroco plumário, que era praticado pelos indígenas, como já foi é, muito estudado, e que depois reapareceu no Hélio Oiticica, nos parangolés do Hélio Oiticica. E tínhamos também é, o, o chamado barroco mulato, é, em Minas Gerais, é, que, é, de músicos que conheciam é, músicos clássicos e os readaptavam é, com os ritmos brasileiros. Então, é, sempre é possível que em, o momento em que a tradução se aproveita, inclusive, do inimigo, que é, termina por ser incorporado e se propõe um novo sistema plural conexo. Por isso que eu acho muito interessante que o Lotman, ele sempre fala da tradução como um modo de conectar o diverso, como se fosse possível sempre se criar uma poética do simultâneo. É muito interessante a simultaneidade e não as revoltas isoladas porque elas mantêm o isolamento que antes as estruturas de poder executavam. Mais muito ou menos obrigado. assim, Irene. Isso é um assunto muito interessante. Muito obrigada, muito obrigada. Uh, we have a, one more question to Alexei. You brought out the Lotman emphasizes uh, that Lotman emphasizes the moment of choice in historical process, giving some sort of power to conscious uh, Uh, choice of a, of a thinking individual. What do you think of unconscious decisions, collective and individual ones, or even choices that are made but and in the in different outcomes than first expected? I mean, what is important of decisions made out of control uh, from the conscious choice of a thinking individual? Yeah, yeah, but that's that's a very good question. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, he emphasizes the the concept of choice just because you know to just to emphasize the, the importance of the personal choice that you just it's not this kind of you know random uh, unpredictability, not like random uh, particles we just you know fly around and then something happens. Uh, yes, yes, of course, and that that is uh, he he talks about that in in different. Uh, other texts, uh, because we have also uh, the power of an insane person. We have insane person which becomes some kind of prophet in different uh, you know, parts and different time periods and different uh, moments of cultural development. When uh, the irrational, uh, uh, out of the blue choice Uh, becomes the the decisive choice. So that that's that's what it, what what is uh, quite a, an important uh, point here. And um, uh, the idea that uh, you always try to nivellate and to bring it to some kind of logic and rational explanation, uh, even when something is uh, enveloped in, in a very insane kind of way. And this is, uh, well, during the, the history of all wars, we have a lot of anecdotes and, and you know, documented uh, events when it was a very kind of irrational and uh, uh, absolutely not explainable by any logic decision 
which uh, affected quite a lot of other events in 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 in, in the way so yes of course uh, so not not only a very kind of conscious choice but also uh, <clears throat> this kind of haphazard and the insane decisions yes which is of course you know comes to very uh, bad conclusion for all our cultures <laughs> we, we sometimes are just you know pr just prone to these kind of uh, uh, decisions uh, and uh, developments thank you alexei thank you uh, so we finished the first session and I'd, I'd like to thanks everybody, everybody. Mihai, Professor Mihail Lotman, thank you very much for your lecture. Professor uh, Julieta, Professor Amalio, and Professor Alexei, thank you for being with us. And we expect uh, your text for our book. Um, uh, I will announce it further. Thank you very much for everybody. And we have another section. Uh, at um, after words until now <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much for everyone bye bye thank you it was good to see everybody bye bye thank you hasta Mihai. pronto thank you julieta thank you ekaterina elena Arthur, everybody. Ina. Uh, Irene, muito obrigado. Um abraço a todos. Obrigada.